Hello folks and welcome to our game. Myself Shane Stapleton as always joined by Michael Verney and just a note that we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you'll get 15% off. You can see what Michael's wearing there. A tidy little Limerick zip up top. And I've got an old Cork one here. I wonder will uh, Alan Cadigan, who's joining us a little bit later on the show, will he appreciate this? Maybe he'll tell us what um, his first memories of this sort of Cork jersey are. Jesus, yes, really Mike. kicking into gear, Mick, this weekend? Yeah, and I expect a few of these on the terrace and in different places in Ennis on uh, on Sunday. I believe the attendance is up near 21,000 now, or they've gotten kind of like an extension to get another 2,000 people in the place and to be rammed in like sardines. And, like, I don't know about you, but to me, this is the... Like, I know the hurling starts this weekend, but this is the weekend that the championship officially starts. And there's so much good stuff going on this weekend between Ennis, Walsh Park... Derry Donegal, the McDonough Star in Wexford Dublin, the others. This is the, this is the weekend where it all begins. Dreams so, are all intact at the minute, and some dreams will be in tatters by Sunday evening. Yeah, and you know, it, it feels like the football championship won't begin for at least another month when you hit the provincial championships, and even beyond that until the, the All-Ireland group phases start. So it feels like it's miles and miles and miles from that starting because we're just getting damn squib. Like even Kerry Cork this weekend, we'll try and build it up a, a bit, but probably the only show in town in football is that Derry against Donegal game. That's going to be tasty, and we're going to be coming to that topic very, very soon. But first off, we have to talk about the live show that we did in the Dome uh, with Sean Tracy's GA club. This was taking place in Thurless the other day. Jeez, that was a cracker and a great night for the club. Yeah, brilliant night. And uh, obviously, we, it, was, it wasn't recorded, so it was kind of unscripted and unedited. And <laughs> there was some great stuff in there. Uh, some great stories, great chats. And yeah, lots of lots of very interesting talking points maybe that we'll, we'll get on to throughout the show. A talk here on Kerry was very interesting in particular on some of the aspects of Limerick and whether they're very vulnerable or more vulnerable than they've ever been coming into this weekend. So yeah, there's uh, there, was, there, was, there was so much in it. And uh I, I I presume that everyone had a great night because I had a brilliant night. Yeah, and you didn't even have a drink, whereas yeah. the people there certainly could have a few. And, you know, I, I suppose I put it to Kieran. I'm going to play a little clip from the show here. But I did put it to him about the amount of players that Limerick have. And, look, all of these players, as I said at the time, they're generational players, brilliant players. Nobody is questioning them and what they can still add because, you know, until they're knocked off, they're still number one. But there's a lot of players that are hitting the age of 30, Lots of miles on the clock. But crucially, if we look at this image, and I did an article on patreon.com forward slash our game about this. Like all the, the couple of players here, you can see at the bottom, Peter Casey, he's suspended. You can see Darrow O'Donovan up there. He's um, he's injured for this game. Now, the numbers beside the, to the left of all the names are the amount of championship appearances. So you can see all the guys on the left, hugely experienced. But you've got Dan Morrissey underlined there because... He's had some injury issues lately. Declan Hannan's only just back and maybe not at 100% yet. Keane Lynch didn't look 100%. Kyle Hayes has played just one game this year. Sean Finn, the same, didn't look um, to, back to himself against Kilkenny. Mike Casey had a concussion there not so long ago. Richie English, we haven't really seen him. He actually um, featured heavily against Clare last year. Colin Coughlin had the injury. There's some talk of Adam English having an injury as well. So, Michael, when you add all of those things up, it, it feels like a lot could go wrong. And does he persist with the players that have delivered for him time and time again, who, if fully fit, we all feel would deliver again this year? Or does he go for some of the newer blood? Cahill English is obviously the most obvious one, but then you could look at Dunico Dalek, Adam English. I know you'll add a few more in a minute, but I'll just play what Kieran had to say at the show. John Cowley and his management team, whether it's lighting that rules out, compared to performance. And if it's lively, it could be a compound of two positions. The Shannon said there two, two chances to clean had. But in reality, I just think it had about seven or eight of them. And another man could have won four goals. Right? And if he goes down the road with lively, then they definitely will be better. Because I think Don has kept on snapping up the last few years, even though he has, and he's known for making three obvious moves in the line. He knows who make inside out and knows the person to pay us if there's any new weakness there, we hope him at the end of that. So there's a couple of things there, Michael, that you might take up. Loyalty could get caught. And also Brian Lohan, a couple of obvious boo-boos online in recent years, which I suppose we've talked about. Yeah, the, the loyalty one is very interesting. Obviously, 
like he's going to have to there's going to have to be changes with Casey missing and with O'Donovan missing but are they is that you know Gray Mulcahy the you know who the loyal soldier who they know exactly what he will do coming in from the start um, or is it you know a fresh player that they're probably maybe a little less sure of but that you know potentially could light it up a bit more and maybe be able to adapt to the the pace uh, of the game a bit more but then as I said with Graham Mulcahy they probably have fair idea exactly what they're going to get he'll play that he nearly played that kind of defensive role in, in the forwards as well um, so there are going to have to be some changes it's just a matter of whether he rejigs the pieces that he's had since 2018 or he kind of puts some fresh pieces into the fray, be it Colin Coughlin, Adam English. Colin O'Neill has to start, you'd imagine. It's just a matter of, I'd imagine it's it's a matter of where he starts. I, I know Kylie likes to have lads, you know, the finishers coming off the bench, but like Colin O'Neill would be, he'd be sick, he'd be sick if he was a finisher on, on Sunday. Let's call a spade a spade. He couldn't have done much more to earn a starting place for Sunday than he has so far in the league. And it was like it was even looking back at back at the Kilkenny game again, like he was outstanding in defeat. Like he was walking out with ball and he was brilliant under high ball. He has to start somewhere. Um and then it's just it's a matter of does English maybe does English come in somewhere potentially as a starter? I wouldn't think so. I do, I, I do think he'll be pretty loyal to what he the guys that have basically been soldiering for him since 2018. And none of them are there are question marks and several question marks just as regards fitness and timings coming back from injuries and stuff like that. But none of them are like over the top, like a 35 or 36 or anything like that. Far from it. It's just a matter of whether they're ready for Sunday and I think that's going to be that's going to be the fascinating thing yeah it's all about who's right and the trouble is sometimes you can get away with having maybe one lad not 100% right because there's so many other powerhouses and generational players on the pitch the trouble is if you have a couple of lads who are a percent or two off and I think it's a reasonable case to make without people within Limerick you know taking a fit of the vapours and saying we're writing them off you and I, I'm sure we're going to get around to it, making our predictions of who will get out. We'll, I'm sure we'll both put uh, Limerick at the top of the pile. But I do want to make a, a point about Kyle O'Neill. So, excellent. Really, really promising player. But last year, he started out. He started the round-robin game. Got a couple of points, but I don't know was he particularly brilliant that day. And this was in the forwards, right? Then, Munster final, he was, he was brought on that day for Tom Morrissey in the last few minutes, again in the forward line. And did he t- did he do brilliantly in that game? He did okay. He got himself a couple of points, so fair enough. He did fine. But it's when he's been in the backs this year that he's truly been trusted, or it feels like he's more dominant within the games. And the question I'd ask you is, What's the balance here? Okay, because we know that Darrow Donovan isn't going to play, so we're going to have to fill one slot in midfield. And if you're to go with the players that it seems that John Kiley and Kinnerk, etc., trust, David Reedy is the man. Because last year in the Munster final, Keane Lynch wasn't available to play that game, and David Reedy was the guy who played midfield. So I think we could make a decent case that Reedy will start midfield in this game. Then you're looking at the number 13 spot or 15 spot, whatever you want to say, with Peter Casey. Now, interestingly enough, you go back to that Munster final last year, Graham Mulcahy started on merit, presumably within training and the matches beforehand, in that role ahead of Peter Casey. Now, he won two frees in the game, bought them to some extent. Now, look, I, I said he was the 2018 hurler of the year. I rate him massively, but I don't think that that game went particularly well for him. And I'm not, into, and maybe it did based on the stats that Limerick would have done, tackling, etc. But I didn't feel he had a massive impact. And I'm just wondering... Based on Cahill O'Neill playing wing-back and centre-back, actually, against Dublin all year, can he go into that that role as the sort of foraging third inside forward? Not entirely sure that he, he lit it up against Clare last year. Can he go midfield? Or is that too much of a ball from the blue when they've played him half-back all year? And then, when we know that Dermot Burns and Declan Hannan are five and six, who plays seven? If it is Cahill O'Neill... Where are you playing Kyle Hayes? And if you've got Kyle Hayes on the inside line with Seamus Flanagan and Aaron Galan, who does the Peter Casey role? So what I'm saying here is, when you add everything up, there's an awful lot for the team that's always had answers. They've more questions than ever before. Yeah, no, they, they probably do. And I think that, like, that's why 
it's such a kind of a mad role reversal compared to when they went into the first round of Munster last year and they were being billed as unbeatable after winning the league by 11 points. And Whereas now there's loads of question marks, which is not necessarily a bad thing, to be honest with you. And if, well, can if you anything, answer them? Can you answer them? Yeah, well, I, I, I wouldn't be. I said it a couple of weeks ago. I wouldn't be a bit surprised given the fact that they probably they probably had a fair idea what that Darrow Dillon was going to miss the two games. Once the, the league semi final against Kilkenny happened, they knew Peter Casey was going to be missing. I honestly don't think it's it's anything but beyond, beyond the realms of possibility that Kyle Hayes plays somewhere in the forward line. It's they've had four weeks to prepare for it. Um, I presume, like by all accounts, I think his injury cleared up about three or four weeks ago as well. So they've had plenty of time to trial it. Um, they wouldn't have had that much time to trial it before he played against Cork there in 2022. If that's if that's what they feel they need to do to balance the team out a bit better uh, and add a bit more of an X factor to the attack, I think that's a that's a possibility. It's also a possibility that that could happen during the game. Even but who does... plays the Casey role because they play two up top and then Casey is up and down. Um, up to three. I... I, I wouldn't be that surprised. I wouldn't be that surprised if they started Graham Mulcahy in that role because they know what they what they're going to get out of him. To be honest with you, and then that would be hit. That would be O'Neill at seven, Reedy at nine, maybe Hayes at eleven, and Mulcahy in, in a corner forward. So are you dropping Keane Lynch? Uh, sorry, Hayes could go. Hayes might go inside with Galan, or he could play half forward either, or Lynch could play midfield. Or David Reedy could play wing forward. I think it's all. I think it's all relatively fluid. But it's not. I tell you why it's not because no team is more pre-prescribed in their roles than Limerick. Like you've got someone doing that Peter Casey role. Like he's the best in the country at doing it. And if he's not doing it, it has been Graham Mulcahy over the last number of years. They've both been excellent at it. Who else has done that role successfully? For Limerick, because they will want someone specifically doing that role. They're not going to throw their tactics out the window just for for this game. And you've got to pick somebody at wing back. Is it going to be O'Neill or Hayes? Does Reedy start? Does Keen Lynch when he didn't look one hundred percent right? You know, does he move to centre forward because maybe it's a little bit easier there? Not as marked as tightly. I think you're tongue tying yourself a bit here now. To be honest, with you. I'm not because I've sat down and I tried to pick this team all week, and these are the questions I'm throwing at you, like. Are you are you picking Kyle O'Neill wing back or Kyle Hayes? I I think for the balance of the team, I'd probably pick O'Neill for this game wing back, and I'd put Hayes in the half forward line. Okay, so you know Hegarty and Tom Morrissey were agreed they're going to start in the two wings as ever. So yeah, now uh, he could he could potentially he could potentially start inside as he did against Cork in twenty twenty two as well. So who's going to be the roving corner forward then? Uh, you're, you're, you're getting you, but you're getting yourself tongue-tied about this roving not. corner you're forward. You're ignoring reality. If, if, if they want somebody to do a prescribed role and they know that he's going to turn over the ball a couple of times, he's going to stop a couple of boys coming out, he's going to make them turn back, he's going to work unbelievably hard for 50, 55 minutes, potentially get a score or two, then Graham Mulcahy is the man for that role, despite his, his advancing years. They know exactly what they're going to get out of him. So who's not starting then? I'm not tongue-tied here. I, I've weighed this up 10 times over, and I'm asking you, who of these players isn't going to start? Okay. Nicky Quaid. I actually don't think Sean Finn will start, um, but that's just based on the league, semi, league semi-final. Maybe he's been flying it since. I think it'll be Mike Casey, two. It'll be Dan Morrissey, three. Um, right. it, it'll be Nash at four. Burns at five. Hannon at six. O'Neill at seven. Donahue at eight, Reedy at nine, Hegarty at ten, Morrissey at twelve, Lynch at eleven, Graham Mulcahy at thirteen, and Hayes and Galan will be inside, two man inside, and that will leave Flanagan on Flanag- the Flanagan to come in as to, to be the impact man that they're well, there's a couple of impact men, but I think he'll probably come in for Mulcahy on the 50th minute. That would be that would be my prediction how it would go. Okay, so just for clarity then, we're agreeing that there will be somebody playing the role that Casey has been playing, which is Well, like, of course, if that's the, that's the way they play like so he's the most obvious I one know, I would say to play. But, but this is why I've had to nail you down over because a little while ago you were talking about three lads up top in Hayes, Flanagan and Galan and I was saying, well, who's going to play the Casey role and then you told me I was getting tongue-tied. 
And now you've repicked the team when I forced you to answer. Never, never mentioned Flanagan inside. You can go back. You can go back and check if you want. I never, never mentioned about playing three inside. But I said to you who was going to play the Casey role, and you said, "But sure, I said Graham not... Mulcahy. I said it about six times. Yeah, but you you hadn't dropped Flanagan at that stage. But she didn't ask me who I was dropping. You asked me who was playing this role from the oh forward God. role. That you're, that you're absolutely fixated with. I am. I, I am very fixated on it because I think it's the biggest challenge that they have coming into it this week. We've got Tony Considine coming on soon as well. I'm sure he'll have a tuppence worth to add to it. Can I just say something as well? I actually don't think it's a bad thing that Limerick are beaten in the league semi-final and there's plenty of questions flying out around them and that there's bits of doubts here and there, plenty of motivation, plenty of low-hanging fruit if they're looking for it. And then you're looking from a Clare point of view. I just wonder, is everything a little bit too rosy? Um, they won the league final. Now, they didn't win it unbelievably impressively. And this, this would kind of have me just a, a small bit worried for them. Like, if you'd said beforehand that Clare, you know, Obviously, we're only come in at half time. Claire minus Tony Kelly, who we don't know who's going to feature at the weekend, but a strong Claire side that's gone through the league unbeaten will only beat a TJ Reid less Kilkenny team by one score. I would have said, Jesus, that that maybe that that's not great. And and uh, they beat a Kilkenny team that was just that they were hanging on nearly probably at the end. So I, I'm sure they haven't, but Brian Norton will definitely guard against them getting lulled into any false sense of security anyway. And I'm sure whether it was the Wednesday or the Thursday after, that there was a few rockets landed their way and a few kind of blasts of reality landed their way as well. Because what's awaiting them on Sunday is something completely different. And, you know, in the 2022 Munster final, the epic, the one that went to extra time, do you know, do you, you, you remember well that Kyle Hayes started that game full forward. And actually, Paul Flanagan did quite a good job on mm. him. And it feels like Paul Flanagan has gone down the pecking order. Now, whether he should or shouldn't have, I, I think he's done quite well in his Clare career, which started a little bit belatedly. But if they start Kyle Hayes up full forward, and to be fair, with James Flanagan's size, it's also a concern. If your two cornerbacks are, and look, he's obviously excellent, Adam Hogan, and then you've got Cormac Lean, or you've got maybe Rory Hayes, who seems to have fallen into the impact sub role. I mean, there is a size mismatch straight away. Yeah, that's potentially, like, as I said, like, Limerick, Limerick have had plenty of time to plan for this, I would have said. And I think they'll, not that they won't, definitely won't be putting all their eggs in the one basket or anything like that, but they'll have looked at Clare and potential areas that they, that they can get at. I don't think, you know, I don't think, they, I think they'll be potentially trying to look for a mismatch like that. And, like, put Landon Hayes in to that full forward line and having to worry about Hayes and Galan potentially inside. Now, I, I, I've no intel to say that that's what's going to happen. I'm just kind of more looking at the balance of the team and the way that it would probably play out a bit better for them. They know, it's a fair idea what they're going to get on e from O'Neill at wing-back and how good he was in the league semi-final and games previous as well. Fairly happy that he fit in seamlessly enough. Will he be the exact same as Kyle Hayes? No, he won't. He's not a bad replacement to have for him. But and then Hayes adds something different, maybe in around the forward line that you're not going to replace like for like with Peter Casey. He's just not there. But you're adding something a bit different. Remember, like Hayes hadn't played hadn't played in the forward line in a couple of years. Remember when they played Cork, and then he, he'd done very little. Then all of a sudden he gets this ball and goes in this meandering solar run and bangs in a goal when they really needed it. Do you know what I mean? He's not gonna. I don't think he's gonna score one four, but he could have a couple of huge potentially match-winning plays in around there as well, if he does play there. Yeah, that was a very naive Cork defence he was up against. They they really performed very poorly in that game. Jeez, I remember midway through the second half, it was almost like embarrassed murmuring throughout the crowd. Uh, Kelsman says, hey, full forward, lads, any chance of a sensible chat? Now, what I would say is he played that All-Ireland final in 2022 at centre-forward, and the half-back line from K for Kilkenny had a very difficult outing that day. So maybe it'll be as simple as Kyle Hayes centre forward, Keane Lynch midfield, and hope that the body is right. Like it's not like we're questioning whether Keane Lynch is still one of the best players in the country, and he's only twenty eight. It's just a question of is his body under pressure at the moment. We saw those calf socks during the uh, league semi final, and he just wasn't moving well. Even just you know from the very first run in the game, that time he was turned over leading up to TJ Reid's goal, it just doesn't look right. I mean, I, I don't think that's an unfair thing to suggest, is it? No, I don't think so. No, he has. He hasn't. Uh, he probably hasn't opened up during the league. Maybe like you'd, you would have seen what we say the old Keane Lynch. Um, but like, if they're if they're looking at 
where they're going to get the best out of him, it, pro it probably is at 11, realistically. So that will depend. It all depends on different parts. And listen, there's going to be bits and bits and niggles. One of, you know, there could be one of the other kind of main lads that we're talking about there starting could potentially have a knock and, and not feature as well. You just don't know. And I'm sure you're not going to know until, realistically, you're probably not going to go, know until 15 or 20 minutes before throwing on Sunday. But I don't think it's mad. I don't think it's mad talk to say that, that Hayes will be up in the forward line. It's definitely, I'd, I'd say there's a distinct possibility that could happen. There's lots of different things going to happen here. There's yeah. several different things going to happen. Um, and there's, they're not just going to, like they're missing two of their main men, so they can't just play straight up. There's going to be a couple of changes. And that, that's the brilliant thing about this. It, it feels like in the past, Limerick always had the answers because they had such a strong squad and it's still really strong. But at least now there's stuff for us to debate and fight over and be like, <laughs> okay, that team, it, it, it's, you know, there needs to be a little tweak here or what if you put this guy here, the knock-on effect over there, we don't have Casey and all that kind of stuff. What time is Tony Considine due on? He's supposed to be, he should be in now. Um, did, you send, did you send him the link? No, I did, I emailed it to him and all, yeah. Now, we had problems the last time getting on, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping, there's, no, I'm hoping there's no problems today with a bit of luck. Yeah, okay. Well, look, while we're waiting for that, will we take up the topic of, um, you know, the latest with what's happened with, I suppose, this this past week or so, we've seen Jim McGuinness, uh, you know, fresh from what happened in the tw after the 2012 um, All-Ireland Final when he didn't didn't want to continue the press conference until a journalist, Declan Bogue, was asked to leave the room. Now, I was there at the time and couldn't really believe what was going on. Um, so Declan Bogue had been involved in a book, This Is Our Year. Kevin Cassidy had partaken. Very Kevin good Cass book. Very, yeah. very good book. I'd recommend it to anyone. Yeah, but like the way it panned out, it was just, yeah, Kevin Cassidy obviously got dropped. And, you know, uh, Declan would have been at several press conferences and all this. He's explained this on the record before. And it ended up then, when Jim came out to do the interview and he talked about this, he was told by who, I'm not entirely sure, that the journalist who had written the book, which is Declan Bogue, that he had, um, that he was there. So straight away, Jim left the room. And I was in the room at the time. I was writing an article. I wasn't paying attention to all this happening because I was just trying to get something written. But there was a bit of a kerfuffle and I didn't pay much attention to it. Out went um, Jim again. Then in came Siobhan Brady, who's the press officer in Croke Park. And she told, explained to Declan that uh, Jim wouldn't be coming out until he left the room. So then Declan said, well, look, I'm not going to stop everyone else getting their work done. He left the room. And then all of a sudden, Jim came back in. And, you know, he was, and I remember at the time, Maliki Clark and journalist for the Times, he was like, you know, what's going on? Are, are we going to sort of stand for this? This is my memory of it. And as I said, I was writing away, so I wasn't entirely sure what he was talking about. And then Jim came back in and he was, he was asked about it. And this is the first time ever that I've made a video.
uh, well, that's one of the questions. Uh, it would be easy for me to turn around and say, you know, I want an apology, that this is wrong, or that's wrong. The reality is, once it's out there, as a historical document, once things are printed in the media, it's, it's out there. It doesn't matter if he turns around 24 hours or three weeks or three months later and apologizes. The people that read it in the first place have made their mind up. The people that read that that, that, that document have, have a, a concept in their head about me and personal issues about me and certain situations with my affairs. And that will not that cannot be changed moving forward. And that's why I held the court. And that's the bottom line of it. And I'm not going to be saying one thing and doing one thing. Except for I'll answer any questions and that's the end. And I work with the media. I always work with the media, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let anybody write the course. Okay, so look, obviously the audio wasn't perfect on that because it was from 2012. 2012, yeah. Fair 2012. Fair, taking a video. I didn't think video even existed back then. Yeah, like that was one of the early, I'd say, Samsung Galaxies. And I just saw this kerfuffle. As I said, I hadn't fully noticed what had happened in the lead up to it because I was working. And then I was like, this is astonishing. I just pulled up my phone. And I don't know, could you make out everything that was being said? There was probably difficult at times, but... He was basically very, very upset about stuff that had been written and the book, of course, and um, he, yeah, very much standing up for what he believes in there. Basically, what he, what he, what he was saying was that he thought there were inaccuracies in the book um, that basically went against his character or questioned his character and questioned the character um, of some of some of his players. And he said he asked Dexon to correct them. Um, no, he didn't what... ask him. He like that even if they were corrected. You know that the information is still out there and joe actually paul kimmage uh in the indo he had a piece with mcginnis before and i was looking it up earlier and I, i'll just read out some of it because it just fleshes out the story even more and um you know he was in line of questioning jim and then jim says we had a group of people with the ambition of being all ireland champions we had one of the people in that group leaving the group and spending saturday after saturday after saturday after saturday with a journalist while we're in the process of trying to win the all ireland so that's obviously kevin cassidy and declan bogue and uh, Paul Kimmy said, that's not the journalist's fault. And Jim says, hold on a second. I was not going to be a hypocrite. I was not going to sit in that press conference and pretend it didn't happen. That would have been the easy thing to do. The hard thing was to go, I'm taking a stand here because if there was one thing, and I'll get animated now, if there was one thing that had the potential for that day not to happen, that was it. And Paul says, that, was, that wasn't that was Bogue's fault. Uh, Jim says, are you sure about that? Paul says, absolutely. He's a journalist. He's doing his job. Jim says, but it has to be done properly. Uh, Paul Kimmage, yes, it has to be done properly, but he's not answerable to you. Jim, he doesn't have to be answerable to me. Paul, he's doing his job. Jim, that mean that doesn't mean I can't have an opinion. Paul, of course you can have an opinion, but you're holding him responsible. Jim, finally, I'm holding him responsible on equal terms for the fact that if there was one thing that could have impacted on that day not happening, that book was it. And you, and, uh, and you don't want to see that. So where do you lie with all of this? Well, Declan's obviously doing his job. Um, mm. And the premise of the book was to basically, you know, be in regular contact with a player from each of the nine counties in Ulster. I think all nine were represented. And basically, you know, what are they doing in the background? What are their aspirations for the year? Um, you know, highs after wins, lows after losses or whatever. Um, and what I remember reading what Kevin said in the book, and it was it was very good. Like, but, it, you know, I didn't think it was. You know, Often complimentary, think, actually. Yeah, no, well, very. I would have said very complimentary. I didn't think it was. Um, I didn't think it was anything that would take Dunny Gall down or anything like that. Far from it. But Jim obviously saw it as a as a slight against his setup and against him. But he, to me, he's taken it. I don't listen. I don't know what his relationship is with Kevin, and we've obviously spoken with Kevin on this show. But he's taken it particularly personal with Declan, who to me is doing his job. And doing a fine, making a fine good effort at it as well, um, and obviously 
the reason this has been brought up again is because uh, Declan obviously made it known uh, yesterday that the same thing happened at the, the Ulster uh, Senior Football Championship launch where Jim basically told the press officer up there in Ulster that he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't speak to Declan or he wouldn't speak to any journalists if Declan was in a group or whatever. So 12 years later, um, history is repeating itself. And, you know, I find that, I have to say now, I, I find that kind of baffling now at this stage that, that it's still going on, that that is still going on and that it hasn't been let lie from Jim's side. I think, Dec- to me, Declan was the one that was wronged. And I think even from chatting to him off the record, that he has let it lie, but how do you let something lie when you're basically digging up like old wounds here and basically preventing him from doing his job? Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I think McGuinness is in the wrong here, I have to say, and I think he's you know trying to deny someone from doing a job that they're earning their crust from. Yeah, it's it's how hard a line do you take on this omerta that's supposed to be inside county groups, and some people do take it unbelievably seriously both while it's happening, which of course is totally understandable, and then long thereafter, you know, they would never talk about what happened within the group. Or even like, you know, sometimes you might talk to a player who's played against a team you might be coming up against soon, and you might ask them and they'll say, sorry, look, I just don't think that that's the the right way to go about things, whereas a lot of people will happily tell you all about it. But I messaged uh, Declan before, and he didn't mind if I was uh, going to play that video there. I messaged Jim as well. I didn't hear back. I gave him about four four hours plus sort of notice just to say, I mean, and I didn't expect for a moment that he'd want to come on and talk about it, but I just wanted to give that courtesy, extend that courtesy. But for my money, I think uh, Declan did a great job in getting a player to agree to do it. And from that point of view, brilliantly done. Now, within that, Jim did say that there was inaccuracies, but he's never fully expanded from from what I can see and what those inaccuracies might be. So when you're leaving people in the dark and what they are, then it's very, very difficult for people to sort of row in behind you. Um, so I think that's where some of the trouble lies. Oh, definitely, yeah. Without a doubt, like we don't... Jim has a few things stuck in his craw. We're not exactly sure what they are. Um, and the story is still going on 12, 12 years later, which is kind of hard to believe, really. Yeah, um, still no sign of Tony Considine. I don't know if you want to give him a, a quick text there and, and hopefully he might be in a position. I, I'll, ju- I'll jump off for a second, Shane, and I'll give him a call, okay? Okay, I do. I'll go through uh, some of the fixtures we have coming up this weekend. Um, I suppose just to start off with, with all the hurling ones and we'll come back and talk about them a lot. In the in, in Munster, it's Waterford against Cork at Walsh Park Sunday, 4 o'clock. Clare and Limerick is uh, on at 2 o'clock. In, in the Leinster Championship, Kilkenny against Antrim. Kilkenny going for five in a row. Wexford, Dublin feels like it's the big one in Leinster. And then Galway against Carlo. Joe McDonough will see down against Mead. Leash Offaly, uh, which would be tasty enough local derby. Westmead, Kerry. Christy Ring will see Derry against Tyrone. London, Sligo, Kildare, Wicklow. In the Nicky Rackard, you've got Monaghan, Ross Common. May will visit Donegal and Loud will host Antrim. Laurie Maher, Warwickshire, Leitrim. Fermanagh against Longford and Lancashire against Cavan. Then on the football side of things, Derry against Donegal. So that will be tasty. I mean, it is a, an element of a sideshow coming into it this week. But Jim McGuinness bringing um, his team to Celtic Park against uh, Derry and Mickey Hart is very, very tasty. Cavan will meet Tyrone in Munster, Waterford, Clare, Kerry, Cork. And in Connacht, Roscommon will meet Mayo and Sligo will do a battle with Galway at Markovitz Park. Just um, some of the, the stats we've done this week, and I know it's been in a few places, but when you look at the round-robin table from 2018 to present, and obviously there's a couple of COVID years in there where it reverted to being a knockout competition, but I'd love to get your comments in here and see what you think of this. But just in terms of the, and this doesn't include the finals, but just in terms of how much points the teams have accrued in that period of time, from 16 games, Clare have gotten 23 points. 11 wins, one draw and four defeats is pretty good going. Limerick, who have obviously been uh, fairly dominant when it comes to the provincial championship in recent times, uh, nine wins, three draws and four losses. Cork, seven wins, three draws and six losses. Tipperary, I mean, I'm sure people are going to cry a river for me over this one, but not doing particularly well there. Seven defeats, four draws and five losses. And then finally, Waterford, that's a pretty disastrous run uh, from here to four. Just two wins, one draw, which we all know they probably should have beaten Tipperary at that time, the Austin Gleeson ghost goal and so on. And an amazing 13 defeats 
which um, is scarcely believable when you think about it. We'll move on to the Leinster record then and looking at Galway at the very top. What really stands out to me there is that they've managed to be beaten just one time in the entire run. And I suppose the, the most incredible part of that is that it was the one time that they got knocked out because Dublin beat them. And I suppose by dint of only beating Carlo by six points in the championship, that's how they got knocked out. By the way, we've just put in the, the teams that have been ever present from the Leinster run because there's, there's several other teams who've been in and out in recent times. But obviously, we're only comparing like with like here because all these teams have played the same amount of games. Kilkenny then, 24 points to Galway's 30. Wexford with 17. And Dublin, that's a pretty desperate record as well. They've just eight wins, uh, three draws, and uh, seven losses. So, not well. It's not. It's not quite desperate. I haven't actually. Um, I didn't actually fully update that number there. That should be Dublin on. Let's see, nineteen points. I think nineteen points. Yeah. So probably I, I need to update that fixture a small bit. Just go through some of the comments here. Uh, Paul Kimmage challenged Jim McGuinness to point out the falsehood he was talking about, and McGuinness refused to do it. Any journalist that allows McGuinness to get away with this now is a coward. Five draws is some going for Wexford, says Lee Mack. Oh, one. Richard Hogan, amazing how the round robin suits Claire so well. And yes, Wa yet Watford just can't seem to have any joy at all. And yet still the funny thing is with Watford, in recent years, they've gotten to an All-Ireland final, of course, in 2020, and an All-Ireland semi-final in 2021. And both of those teams, both of those years, didn't have the round robin. Actually, another thing to bring up here as well is when I was uh, going through all of that, well, sorry, Ver uh, Vernie did some of the, the stats on that. But when I was looking at how how this all played out in terms of um, how many managers each of these teams had in Munster anyway. Tipperary and Watford are at the bottom of the chart and it's no surprise that they've had a big turnover of managers. Now, maybe not all of it, like some of it is just, that's just how it panned out. But Limerick and Clare are up at the top and they've had just two managers each and Clare obviously have had the continuity of having Lohan there for the last five years. Cork have three um, had three managers in that time, and they're at the midway point as well. So I suppose to some degree, it sort of uh, it makes some sense to some degree. So uh, keep your comments coming in. I'm just waiting for Michael to come back there or Tony Constantine to click in if he sees it at all. But uh, I might just start off with uh, looking at Limerick against Clare and the run that they've had in recent times. As I said last year, it was just um, there was there was very little between the teams, of course. Clare beat Limerick by a point in the in round robin, but it was a point the other way for Limerick in the uh, in the game at the Gaelic grounds for the Munster title. And watching that back, I have to say the fact that Tony Kelly didn't get a free at the very end of the game was absolutely incredible because he was completely dunted in the head. I think it was by Peter Casey. And then the ball was worked back out again. And Aaron, Sh Aaron Shanahan did brilliantly to uh, to fashion or to get the ball out of a ruck situation, knocked it on to Adam Hogan. And actually, he went into contact, and I know we've talked about this in recent weeks, but he ended up um, he ended up sort of falling a little bit too generously into contact, and uh, a, f a free was never given for him. And he looked there with Considine. Unfortunately not, no. Technological issues. He can't, he can't log in. He, he was able to log in before, but <clears> unfortunately <throat> not, no. Um, he, he said to apologise and say that we're feel free to call him an A S S H O L E, but we'd never we'd never do that, Tony. We'd, 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 ne we'd never do that. We're, he was actually he was mad to chat, um, and he wanted to chat me about the match on the phone. On the phone, but unfortunately that wasn't a runner. I needed to get back on here. Um, no, disappointed because Tony's always um, he never uh, he never pulls any punches with with what he what he thinks anyway. So uh, would have been nice to get the Claire angle as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll try and get him in the future. But um, just in terms of this Clare against Limerick game and going back over the last number of years, if you were to include, sorry, if you were to take out extra time in the 22 Munster final, every game, and you add up the aggregate score ever since Brian Lowen took over in Clare, it's been a draw. It, it works out as kind of that they're level throughout those five games. That's quite an incredible record. The only one you're take, taking out there is the extra time in 2022. Really? Because uh, Limerick won by six or seven in twenty twenty, didn't they? In Lowen's sorry, first year. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So I I apologize. Sorry, since twenty twenty two, not twenty twenty. Okay. Yeah, they've been on. Should have. They've been crazy tight, and that's <laughs> like that's why 
Now I see some people predicting like Clare to win by five, and like anyone, anyone, I think anyone thinking that this is going to be anything more than a one score game either way is bonkers to be honest with you. Um, and really, what what make there's so many fascinating aspects to it. Depending on the result, obviously, just say Limerick were to be beaten, you know they go to Tipperary next week, who are fresh. If Clare are beaten, they go to Cork next week, who are fresh. There's there's a hell of a lot riding on it here. Now I don't think a defeat. As we showing last year with Limerick, I don't think a defeat would uh, would mean that you're going to be out of the championship or anything like that. I think both are well well capable of regrouping. Um, but it's just yeah, just an intriguing clash. The Tony Kelly thing, I think, Shane, was very interesting. I don't know if you mentioned it there while I was missing. Um, you know, some people saying that he's going to come straight back into the team. I just don't, I don't see it. Um, I'm hearing he was by all accounts he was fit to feature in the league final, but didn't. How, how fit that is, I'm I'm not sure. I think he'll be he'll be named in the twenty six, and I think he'll come in with twenty minutes to go. Maybe they will start him, but as I said before, Kelly is gent. Like apart from like his best games have come against Limerick. Obviously, I, I I will say I will say that as a caveat, he's generally best when he has a run of games and a run of form to get himself into form. He hasn't hurled competitively in what are we looking at six months? Real realistically. That's a lot to ask, even of one of the best players of all time, to throw him into that. Like these games, like you do not get a chance to breathe. Like this is one touch into the hand, or you're dead. That that that's the way these games are. Um, and you can have played as much as you like with in in house games and stuff like that. Unless you know yourself, even coming from a layoff or anything like that, it's lovely to be exposed to a game a few weeks before a big game where you get to make those mistakes, where you get to be, where you're at, where you're off the pace and noticeably, noticeably off the pace, but you come on for the run like a horse in a couple of weeks' time. Do you know what I mean? It's a lot to ask, I think, to throw him in from the off and expect him to be absolutely humming. And so I think I think he'll come in potentially and he'll look, no one will look at it as Tony potentially being a game winner off the bench. Yeah, and I mean, I think this is probably the first time that we've ever looked at Clare, well, I suppose, in, in modern times since Tony Kelly became the main man, that you look at the team and think they could win this game without him. But yeah. when I look back at those two games last year, and, you know, I know I love when people say it, and I watch them closely. But, you know, I, obviously I was analysing as it was going along, and I was like, Ed McCarthy's played brilliantly in the league since getting his position back, especially coming on the league semi-final against Tip. He was not good in either of these two games last year, and his free taking was a little bit ropey in those in those games against Clare last year, um, especially the first day. And Tony Kelly, since twenty from twenty twenty to last year, they played in five championship matches against Limerick. He scored fifty six points from those games, so twenty eight frees, so it's pretty much split half. So he scored eleven points per game, which is five and a half. You know, if you can look at it that way, five and a half points from play per game and they may be it just depends on can you take the gamble of right we may win we may lose this game do we gamble everything to win a first round game like we did last year and yeah you got the win and you celebrated hard which i don't think they'll do this year if they win but do you risk it all and just say throw him in there because he's just been so crucial against limerick yeah, so yeah. these are and like we're obviously not privy to it, but like these are the conversations that the player management have been having. I'd say with Tony Kelly and Tony Kelly alone, and nobody else really knows about what they're saying or what their aims are or what their what their goals are. Whether it's twenty minutes, whether it's starting, whether it's maybe not featuring at all. Um, and like I w wouldn't it be great <laughs> if there was just an announcement over the Tannoy in in Cusick twenty minutes before throwing late change in the Clare team. Tony Kelly starts or whatever like that would the place would absolutely erupt um and like from a you know a supporter's point of view and a spectator's point of view I I I'd, I'd love to see that happen whether it's the right thing or not is 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 another story but only they know how much he has under the belt only they know how he's been performing in, like I don't even know if they've had an in-house game realistically would they would they've had an in-house game last Sunday maybe a week after the league final potentially not it probably wouldn't have been a full bore one I'd say anyway it wouldn't have been 70 minutes 35 minutes and a half lads killing each other I, I don't think it would have been anyway um so it'd be it'd just be fascinating to see when he when he does feature and when he's on the pitch just what sort of a pitch he is at is he at 80 percent is he close to the 100 if he's close to the 100 it's it's start him but I very much doubt that he is when I watch those games back 
what was very evident is how different, you know the way they say styles make fights in boxing, how different their styles were. Now, they were both absolutely blood and thunder in the tackle. We know that's going to happen no matter what. I thought Claire were very good at getting close to Limerick players as they were trying to come up the field or come out the field or, you know, come through. And they were very good at getting in close with the hurley out, the arms out, trying to narrow their options. But when Claire got the ball, oh my God, the amount of times they shot from 100 yards. And like, if you were Mark Rogers, who got a goal, remember that time Tony Kelly hit a, he was looking to shoot from distance, which of course you'd understand with Tony Kelly, came down off the post and he knocked it into the back of the net. Yeah. And I was just thinking, imagine if Rogers got a few balls bounced in front of him, the damage he'd do. And you just couldn't have two more different teams in that clear blood and thunder as they are. And then they come out and everybody's shooting from 100 yards. And it doesn't matter if they're on the sideline on their own 45, they're having a go. Whereas Limerick are measuring the ball up the field. They're popping it either side of the D. Uh, and because Clare are going fairly man-to-man, like John Conlon was just following uh, Keane Lynch wherever he went in the game that, that Lynch played, you basically just have to survive back there. So whether it's going to be Conor Cleary, whether it was like, you know, what Keane Nolan had to go through last year, whether it's, you know, Carm Clean, whether it's, you know, whoever it is there, Adam Hogan, you're just going to be told, you're just going to have to survive there. Um, but I just wish from Claire's point of view, they'd mix it up a little bit more and bounce a few balls in front of their inside forward because they get so much more change. It's funny you should say that. Um, I thought one of the most interesting points of the other night in the Dome was, was Seamus Cannon saying basically how he's not necessarily in love with modern hurling for that exact reason that, it used to be an inside forward, you know, would get 10 or 12 balls and your tongue would be hanging out, the ball would be coming into you that much. Whereas now, Limerick still do it well. Galan gets fed plenty, but a lot of other teams do not feed their inside line, whether it's out of fear that, uh, you know, the opposition team are sitting back and that the ball is going to be cut out by a deep line centre back or, what, or whatever it is. But Clare are definitely one of those teams that play a lot from, from out the pitch. And, you know, if they are to win a Munster or win an Ireland, you'd imagine that aspect of their play would have to be have to be tightened up and any shots would have to be... Like, when you see Limerick shooting from distance, it's a, it's usually someone on the front foot and they usually take that extra second to compose themselves, plant the feet if they get the chance, and it's a lot more measured and controlled, whereas Clare, and I'm thinking of the 2022 All-Ireland semi-final, and obviously some of the, sometimes in those games with Limerick as well, where it's just like... You get the ball, um, your blood is up and it's a shot and it's, you know, it's uncontrolled, it's not measured um, and you just love if you were playing inside just to be spray, getting that ball sprayed in a bit more and it makes them less predictable as well and it makes them harder to play against if they're able to add that aspect to their game as well. And maybe they have to some degree against Tipperary, their accuracy was true. To, well, partly that was down to Aid McCarthy just having a day of days then in the in the league final as well, they're shooting in the second half. Well, in total, it was 58%, 63% in the second half, which isn't all that bad. Uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of the comments here because people are mad to get their, their spake in. Uh, Richard Hogan, Clare didn't shoot like mad in that league final. Early exchanges are going to be key. Clare will need to be in front for most of the game to have Limerick on the back foot. And just back to that point, like their whole blood and thunder approach in terms of like getting stuck in and all that, which I love, Maybe it's very hard to just change the mentality from blood and thunder to, you know, ice cool then when you do have the ball. And, and I suppose that the best teams do that. And maybe that's something that you could level at Claire in recent times that when they haven't got over the line, they've lacked, I suppose, that small little bit of composure. I would say the couple of times I've seen them this year, I saw them um, in the flesh against Wexford, down in Wexford Park, um, on the box the last two times, the league semi-final and final. They definitely are playing the ball over and back a bit more. Um, and I think there's less, of, it does look like this year, there's less of a license just to open the shoulders um, for the sake of it. Um, and that little bit, being that little bit more measured could be the difference really. Um, but like, yeah, you might fly through a few more comments. Like this is, like this is manna from heaven. Like Sunday is just uh, like perfect for ev- every hurling supporter realistically. The Monster Championship kicks off and Obviously, Clare and Limerick, the best rivalry in Ireland the last couple of years. And then you have so much on the line in the other game as well. Yeah, OK. So the Don says, Galan holding the hurley will have to be watching this year's Monster Championship. The James Owens decision to give Limerick a penalty last year was farcical, ended Cork's year. 
uh, Ryan Ro Rooney. Am I the only one who thinks O'Neill is just as good as Morrissey and Hegarty in the half forward and not as good as Kyle Hayes wing back? Don't think he starts unless Hayes is playing the Peter Casey role. I would say that uh, both Morrissey and Hegarty are still at this point ahead of Kyle O'Neill. What would you think? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. They've a lot, yeah. lot more in the bank. And I know Hegarty was quiet and a lot of lads were quiet in the league semi-final but he ripped it up at earlier stages in the league in a couple mm. of games you know it's not like last year when I felt he never really opened up last year at any stage league or championship I just felt he wasn't himself I think he has a couple of performances in the bag already which I think is big for him and I'd say big for Limerick as well because you know you've done it very very recently and you know you can get to that level like he controlled I know this is a poles apart but he controlled that game from Crow Park against Dublin and I know that's miles away but he opened up in Crow Park and was dictating the play every which way setting up scores getting scores himself and just moving very very freely I yeah I'd still have he'd still have him and Hegarty uh, ahead of O'Neill for that spot yeah crack of the ash I don't know who was hugging him like Swayze hugging Demi Moore in Ghost so uh hugging who are you talking who's I don't know who hugging Who's your um, I think they're going on about... That was Sean O'Donoghue against Galan, wasn't it? Sorry, that's what he was yeah. Yeah, the earlier comment. Uh, blame the ref for everything. No um, no game ever came down to one referee in decision. It can be crucial at times. Where... <laughs> I'd say some, some games definitely have. <laughs> Where will Rodgers be playing? Thoughts him being 11, but I've also heard O'Donnell is 11. Loads of rumours. You know championship is around the corner. One thing for sure, Davy Fitz, uh, Gerald, will be up against uh, Kyle Hayes. It happened last year and... It's a brilliant contest. It really is. And I, I think it'll be spectacular again. Yeah, if Hayes is wing back, um, they will definitely come up against each other. Like, I actually think David Fitzgerald did a really, like, sometimes it's a, it sounds a bit mad to say it, as he's playing as a half forward. But he totally nullified Hayes going forward at different stages last year, which is a, you know, a big part of Hayes' game. And I always said he's a very underrated defender. But I thought Fitzgerald... But Gerald is able to match him physically and he's able to match him athletically going up and down the pitch. And he's, you know, those first couple of steps, that, for sure, they're very similar actually. For sure, he uses the first couple of steps to get away and then stay away. And Hayes does that a lot as well. And if you don't let him build up ahead of steam, you can basically, you know, potentially deny him a 40, 50 yard run and an overlap. So, like, they match up quite well to kind of blunt the other one's influence, shall I say. Mm, okay, so Fiol says, Claire either do blood and thunder or whimper. Uh, Trauma Spieler, what's with the new start time, boys? Is this a permanent feature for the championship? It is. You've got babysitting issues, so we're, we're working around it. Yeah, I, I'm um, I'm doing doing daddy daycare every Thursday, and I don't get relieved until around four o'clock. So unless people want a screaming baby during a podcast during the day, I think it'll be at four o'clock till the end of June, at least, probably the end of the championship. Mm, okay, is there is there any particular? Air, sorry, actually, David Fitzgerald he scored two sixteen in the championship, and there's. I'm, I was just looking at and thinking, like, how much consistency did he have? He scored two points, one point, five, five, one three, a goal. He's pretty good for you know day day in day out. He's getting those scores now. As we said, he can be quiet throughout long spells, but you feel like he's always going to do something. And and actually, to be fair, in his clash with Hayes last year. There were moments where they both made impacts and won freeze or whatever. But I think they'll both come up with big moments in this game. And another point from the, the match last year is the discipline Limerick have in the tackle. Now, they give away a freeze. Everyone does. But some of the freeze that Clare give away are insane. And I know people talk about Clare diving, but Limerick are well able to buy an old free as well. He, just, you really had your poor old Adam Hogan got an awful doing. He got man the match in the league final, and I think you came you came in straight away to just give an out. And time. you agreed? No, I, I, yeah, I, I would have complimented him first before maybe go, go going after him in that respect. Who he picks up is going to be fascinating as well. But I think um, Colin, the onus will be on Colin Lines to be uh, very, very careful, shall we say, about lads buying freeze and like if you do it early. And we say Hogan goes to buy a free, or whether it's Willow Dunahoo or whoever it is, and and you blow them for over carrying, or you just the play goes on, and all of a sudden it's a free the other way. Lads, lads will stop doing it because they know it's you know that's not the currency today. Um, so I, I'm sure the referees have been chatting the last couple of weeks, and there's certain things that they focused in on that definitely would be one that you would look very very closely on. And the only thing I will say as well is that lads do. 
need to not give them the opportunity to do that by not putting their hurl up around there at all, like anywhere in the vicinity, and you're not giving them any chance to, you know, basically go under anything, shall we say, um, and hold them up a bit better. But uh, who Hogan picks up, like, would they? I, I presume Cleary goes on Galan. Um, Hogan, like, th- that's why, that's why. I think there's a, just a potential for a bit of an X factor or something with, with Hayes, something a bit different that, that Claire won't be ready for. Um, but like the blood and thunder of it all is all well and good. But as one of the commenters said there, generally the team that keeps the head amidst all of that has been the team that prevailed. Claire kept the head probably a little bit better in the group stages. Limerick kept the head probably better in the Munster final, albeit they could probably should have been a free realistically to, um, to level it up but I think Tony Kelly was a culprit of himself because he bought one the week before in Ennis and I think the referee potentially maybe had that in the back of his mind and didn't blow it then at the end I think it was Liam Gordon mm. Do you know the, like as I was saying those four games from 2020 um, was it 2021 or whatever it was or maybe 2022 and then again last year it being level other than extra time the big difference actually that day was the lads who came off the bench for Limerick, they ended up getting a couple of scores. I think it was um, maybe Connor Boylan and David Reedy, they played scoring parts. Whereas on the other side, Clare weren't able to match that impact. And the players that they had to take off, Tony Kelly, remember he cramped up and eventually he went off. Shane O'Donnell had to go off. Peter Duggan had to go off. So depth to some degree. Look, they've developed some of the players that they had then. So those same lads might make more of an impact now. And it feels like one or two more have started to come through. Whereas with Limerick, if we're saying that we don't have Casey, we don't have O'Donovan, and we're now struggling to exactly nail down what the 15 will be, you and I may be pretty close, but we might not entirely agree. But what we probably will agree with on is that the bench isn't going to be as strong as it was in prior days. That if they're dipping into to one or two already to start them, then obviously the bench isn't going to be as strong. And actually the A versus B in the last three or four weeks, if a few of those players that I'd put up on screen, I'd put it up again. Some of the lads underlined have obviously had a certain amount of either fitness issues or issues that they haven't had much game time during the league. The guys that are underlined, the two guys with the X's on them, they're obviously out for this game. But you know yourself, if you're coming into a big game and you want to have those 15 v 15 cracking matches, if you're missing one or two off the first team and then they're taken from the second team and then one or two others are bound to have a knock here and there. And then all of a sudden you're bringing in the third cavalry. You know, it does affect it a little bit. No, of course it does. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, amazingly, we've gone through, I, I don't know how I didn't mention Dunnick O'Dolig as well, who was very, very good throughout the league. And like, it won't be a million miles off start. And I would be surprised if he started. I think he'll come in. I think potentially they'll keep Flanagan in reserve as well. Just to know that they have that, guy who's had massive impacts. I think he scored four or nine for play throughout the Munster Championship last year. Um and we I'm delighted to have an in, we have an inside forward here now beside us in Alan Cadigan. Alan we'll chat about Cork and Waterford at some stage as well, but you must be looking forward to Limerick Clare on Sunday too, I'd imagine. Can you hear us Alan? Can't quite hear Alan there at the moment. Technology's not been our friend today now. I think he could hear us, but might have been a bit delayed as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully he can click in again there. It'll be okay. But um, I don't know. Did you want to finish out that point or did you feel you were done with it? No, I just, I just, like, I think potentially Flanagan could be kept in reserve. And a lot of these guys that were saying could start for Limerick at different stages, they're going to be, Conor Boylan's still going to come in. Adam English is going to come in if he's, I don't know, I think there's a doubt about him. Um... If Mulcahy doesn't start, he'll be ready to come in with te- with ten minutes to go. Even though I do think he'll start, they still have a decent bench, just probably not to the same level of the last couple of years, just because they were already pulling from two before the start. Yeah. Okay. And as the, another point I wanted to ask you is about of the guys that are that I suppose hasn't started, or sorry, of the guys that you might be looking at as backup. The likes of Adam English, the likes of Dunico Dahl, like maybe even Shane O'Brien, who played for the under twenties and maybe it didn't go his way against Tipperary last week. They haven't many appearances between them. Like none of them have. Uh, only Adam English has played in the championship, and I think he scored a point. The only one of them to score a point. So surely that impacts what Kylie's going to do, also. Oh, and I think it feeds into the point that Kieran was making the other night. Um, there's such a balance between 
that loyalty and knowing what guys have given you and giving other lads their, their kind of their debut or their shot at it as well. And like history would suggest that Kylie will stick with what he knows. And that's generally what he's done the last few years. So I, I wouldn't be expecting too many um things completely out of the blue personnel wise anyway. Alan, can you hear us this time? I can't hear him. Can you hear him? No, unfortunately not. He must be muted, I'd say. He could definitely hear us, though, which is good, at least. It's a start. Oh, I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, maybe, Alan, you, if you had another device you could try, it's just not quite happening on this one. Okay, he'll give that a go anyway. Um, There's a question yeah. coming in there from John Crawford. Would Fergal O'Connor make the Clare back line? And there's someone we haven't talked about either. Um, to no me, probably, appearances. Yeah, to me, he probably would make the clear backline. I'd say um, he's not for. I don't think he's a million miles away from making the Limerick backline either. To be honest, I don't think he'd make it. No, I, I, not not a thing stand. I, I just like we're talking about a person who's never played a championship here, and you're comparing with. Would he, you're saying been, would he um, make the clear backline? As in the starting team, yeah. I yeah, Lean, Lean, Lean has never played championship either, and you're yeah. talking about him starting. I'd have Fergal O'Connor in the head in all day every day. Yeah, but like Rory Hayes is more experienced than him. Connor Cleary's there. Paul Flanagan. Uh, I'd I'd be starting. Well, Paul Flanagan. I'm not entirely sure what he's done to not be in the starting team anyway. But yeah, I'd have Paul Flanagan ahead of him. Maybe Rory Hayes at the moment because we haven't seen Fergal O'Connor in championship. That doesn't mean I don't think he has the potential to do it. Prove us all wrong this year. Don't have a problem with that. But I'm just saying, based on what I've seen so far, I've seen a lot. But you know, I've seen more from the others at at this moment in time. Paul Flanagan got an All-Star nomination in 2022 and has kind of struggled to make the team ever since, which is, I don't know, it's it's it's, it's peculiar, but it, listen, he's he's, an, he's another option, but he doesn't seem to be being used as, as an option really. Shane Amore is kind of that floating defender that usually comes in to cover either maybe the, the floating cornerback that goes out or across the half-back line or potentially into midfield as well. But just because Brian Lohan isn't picking him, that doesn't mean that... He shouldn't be starting because we often look at county teams and think, why is that lad not been started? And I would wonder sometimes why is Paul Flanagan not been started? Maybe he's had a knock, maybe some, maybe this or the other, but I don't fully understand it. Okay, we let's. Oh, we can hear him this time. Alan, how are things? Third there's time. Bad, there's bad connection down here in Cork. <laughs> <laughs> how are things with you? Are you keeping busy? I'm good, lads. Good to see. Good to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, you too. You're um, keeping well. We are, we certainly are, and we're getting stuck into the talk about Clare and Limerick. We go straight oh, forward. What do you think? How do you see this one going? Oh, interesting one. Um, I suppose I was thinking there throughout the week that nearly that's probably the biggest game of the weekend. Now I'll get to Cork and Water for a minute, but I suppose looking obviously, most people will be tuning into that at two o'clock on uh, on Sunday. Obviously, yeah. Um, like I was when I when you asked me to come on the show, there I was doing a bit of bit of research on their last encounters and. I think we're going to be in for a bit of a humdinger there on uh, on Sunday. And I say myself, and I said millions of other people are looking forward to that game uh, going ahead now on Sunday. Mm, and do you look at this Limerick team and some of the <clears throat> some of the concerns they have over a few players? You know, are they injured or are they hundred percent yet? And then Darrow Donovan and Peter Casey are yeah. out. Like, do you see an opening there for Clare? Uh, I say, yeah, definitely. I think like in the last five championship games, obviously, if you look at last year, um, you know, Limerick. Got over or Clare got over the line in the round robin, but then Limerick got a vengeance then in the Munster final. So, in the last three, four, five seasons, there's only been really a puck of a ball in the game. Now, I think in 2020, Limerick won by about 10 points, I think. But since then, it's only been one, two, three point games. And I think now, I suppose looking at their learnings, I think probably Limerick going in probably have learned maybe a lot more where they're where they stand at the moment. I kind of I heard there I read recently yesterday that they were away in a warm weather training camp in Portugal. So they had that block of maybe three weeks, maybe three and a half weeks since they um were beaten by Kilkenny in the semi final to kind of see. I suppose obviously you had that, those defensive issues maybe that John Kiley alluded to after the Kilkenny game that he wasn't happy about. But then I suppose you look at Clare on the flip side, they won our um, league champions two weeks ago. They're coming in kind of as I said, ready to go, prime. So you can look at it. You can look at it in two ways, really. And I think you know, did uh, did did uh, did he poke the bear at Limerick? I don't know. Time will tell uh, on Sunday. 
Just on that, Alan, would you prefer to be in the position where you had that three or four weeks like Limerick have had going into the championship? And even to be, like, there was plenty of questions asked after that game, as in, mm. you know, is Sean Finn back to himself? What's the story with Declan Hannon? They got they picked up a suspension. Would you yeah. prefer to be in a camp where everything is rosy, like it is in Clare, or in Limerick, where, like, geez, there's a, there's a few questions been asked of us here, and we need to prove some points and prove that we're, like, we're the team going for five in a row here, just people nearly writing mm. us off. Yeah, like, you can look at it two ways, Michael. Um, obviously, Clare are coming in, really good game there two weeks ago, league champions coming in with momentum. Uh, I know Brian, Brian Law alluded to after that, they have lots of things to work on. You can look at it from both sides. You can say John Kiley and his management team and players had a real good block of training. Did they have any competitive game in the last two and a half, three weeks? We all hear the stories that their A versus B games are as competitive and way better even than challenge matches. Again, we don't know because we're not in the camp. So like, you can look at it from two ways. You know, if, if Clare go out and beat Limerick by three, four or five points, whatever it is, you say, God, they had the momentum. They were coming in uh, ready, prime. Limerick were a bit off. But then you could flip it and you can say, oh, Clare had a really tough league. They went balls out for the league. They needed the silverware. Brian No maybe was under a little bit of pressure. His fifth season, they needed a bit of silverware um, in going into the championship. So, look, you can look at it from both ways. And I've experienced that as a player um, down through the years, kind of, you're going in fresh maybe with maybe three, four, five weeks of preparation or as you're going in then maybe with a bit of momentum. Hey, look, there's no right or wrong answer um, and I think ma all managers are the same really when they think like that. I always prefer to get the kick up the arse. I'd always like to get the, the, the little reminder to the mind where, okay, I need to, maybe I need to go after mm. a few other things here. Whereas whenever, when you're winning, I, I think it was Desi Farage said after the league final against Derry, he said, um, what is something along the lines of that like winning is like basically a lousy teacher whereas you learn a lot in maybe in the defeats a bit more so I, yeah. I, I don't know I don't would have always been in that ment mentality that it's nice to get a little reminder of okay I need to go back to the yeah. ground here you know I, I hope my students aren't listening in <laughs> listening to you talk about that <laughs> <laughs> like yeah I think John Coyle will be not that he'd be happy what happened but I suppose mm, like maybe just bring them down back door maybe a little bit. You have that outside noise. Um, I suppose, look, they, they've managed to deal with it massively over the last number of years, keeping the outside out. Um, and that's important in every camp. Um, but I suppose, like, I think John Coyne will be happy with where he's at, I think. He's going in now, I won't say under the radar, let's say, but he's going in going, yeah, they had a few issues that are now, the defensive issues, like the Sean Finn thing there now. Again, I don't think they'd be too worried about it because I was in the position before where you've come back from an injury and you play your first game and you go, Jesus, Alan Cadigan was fairly off it there. But you have to remember, I think Sean Finn was coming back after nearly a year. So to get 60, 70 minutes in a game, in, of a high-intensity game against Kenny, that's a box tick. I, wouldn't, I don't think they'd be too worried about, oh, his handling was off or his defensive duties, one of the best cornerbacks in the country. So... I think they'd be primed, and I think, as I said, we're in for a serious humdinger of a game uh, at two o'clock on Sunday. What's um, what's it like playing against Limerick? I know you've had a, you obviously had a couple of injuries in the last few years, so I'm not sure how many times you played against them. But what are they like? What are they like? So my first encounter against Limerick would it be? I actually saw a photo on my phone a couple of years ago. Was the 2017 Munster League? against Limerick so if you can remember we were coming off 2016 after being beaten by Wexford mm. in the qualifiers up in Torres bit of a shock defeat uh, it would have been Kieran Kingston's first year so he had to go balls out really the, the following year and we went hard at it uh, so that was my first encounter at Limerick when they were kind of maybe at the 2017 stage they were bringing through those young, young fellas my proper encounter was with them would be in 2018 we played them in the Gaelic rounds uh, if you can remember we we caught them was it 2018 or was it 2019 2019 uh, 19 he beat, 19 he beat yeah. them um, he were I remember we, uh, the centre back from Mill Street his name escapes me at the Ellis, minute he was Mark Ellis. Ellis, was Ellis was standing on the terrace the week previous and then he was centre back that day but he actually a couple, it's funny you say about 17 didn't he hit them yeah. for a bag of goals in the Munster League Kylie got woeful abuse in 17 yeah. 
Yeah, but yeah. Uh, like they were that was they were the start of that journey, and then obviously in twenty eighteen, I I missed twenty eighteen because I had surgery in my knee, and uh, you can remember that game that went extra time. But it was properly when I saw them was twenty nineteen when we had him in the Gaelic Thrones. We caught him on the hop, um, like going back to momentum. I think Cork always do well. Speaking from my own experiences, when our backs are to the wall, we go Cork have to win this game in twenty nineteen. We had to win that game on the Gaelic Thrones because if you can remember, we got absolutely annihilated by Tipperary in Parky Queen the week before. Um, <laughs> we love that. You love that. <laughs> uh, so we have to go to the Gaelic Thrones and win that. But what are they? They're they're an exceptionally organised team. Um, they're a unified team. That's a big thing. You look at Limerick in the last number of years, uh, on Leinster rugby, Irish rugby, Dublin footballers. What do they all have in common is their bond and their unity. They seem a really, really tight group. Um, but like to play against, obviously, they're so well drilled. They, um, like I speak, obviously, I, I look at defenders and see what they're like, but they have a fella for every option, you know. Um, like you're on with their Dar Dunham getting injured. No big issue. Next man up, who would you put in? Maybe David Reedy midfield, maybe. You know, so they don't panic. And that's that's the thing about this congested season is that unfortunately if you pick up a little bit of an injury, maybe first week, you know, will you be will you be available to play in six days or seven days' time? But you're up there, they're going for five in a row. They're exceptional champions. It will take an awful lot of beating to beat them. Uh, I think if you if you're gonna beat them, you're gonna to have to try beat them in Munster. That's the that's the big thing that I've taken from it. That if you try beating a monster, one or two teams can catch them on a monster, maybe. But as I said, there's a lot of things that need to go uh, um, teams' way to get over the line against them. If you, if you look go back to the last couple of years when mm. you know you were involved and you played them, let's say the 2021 All Ireland yeah. didn't go right, lost by 16 points. Then the following year, I think that was the game in Parky Queef didn't go right, even though you would started mm. okay. Just like, can you tell us what you would have been plan? Like, what would you have been trying to target? Is there a certain thing you would have thought we can go after this or make sure we don't fall into this trap when you're preparing for the games? Um, yeah, look, there'd be a there'd be a few small things. For instance, like you know, their half back line obviously is their launch pad. You know, so I'd always see as an inside line. Let's say if I'm playing the full forward line, that my the half back line would be would be pivotal in the in the amount of ball that is delivered in. So if you're playing against them, you're trying to figure out how do we move these lads around. You know, they might identify some weakness maybe in the full back line that they can get after, or maybe like what Kilkenny did. They, if you noticed, all their six forwards they constantly rotated. You know, one minute Adrian Mullen was in full forward, next minute you had TJ inside on one on one situation. Like how often have we seen Limerick in a one on one or two on two situation inside in their full back line? Rarely because you had their half back line sitting. So um they have a decision. So if you have an opposition half forward line and they're going back to the field, nine times out of ten the Limerick half back line don't follow. Do you know they leave them off. So they have that protection in front of them. Um so that's the big thing that I suppose teams are trying to figure out how do you move these the this team around they're extremely athletic. I think if you bring in the if you bring the ball into contact in that middle third, you're asking for trouble with the likes of Declan Hannon, um, you know, Dermot Burns, um, you know, Garrow Higgs, all these guys, Keane Lynch, you know, um, you're asking for trouble in the middle third. So you, you gotta keep you got, it's easier said than done, but you gotta avoid that middle third. Um, but it's it's that's the million dollar question. How do you how do you how do you beat them like? I would have said that you were you hurt them the most in recent years when you actually hand passed it through them. Like Mm. I remember watching the game that that one in Parky Cueve a couple of years ago that you, you lost at home in the first round, and I, and I I counted up the amount of times both teams hand passed or stick passed in the in the first half, and it was pretty much fifty fifty. But you did your most damage when you ran at them like, and I'm going back to the All Ireland final the year before as well when Dara Fitzgibbon, Jack O'Connor, Shane Kingston, and so on just ran straight at them, pop hand pass go again, pop hand pass mm -hmm. go again back at the net, and I just thought. Is that something that you that just happened, or did you talk about it? And you know, why didn't we maybe see more of it? Yeah, that's look. That's one area probably that where teams are saying like, I think, especially when when I do a bit of coaching with the school, that I mean, it's all about keep the ball possession. If you get the ball and you start launching it down the top of Limerick, forget about it. They'll hose it up all day long. So I don't think you can play Limerick at Limerick's game. I think you got to come up with maybe something different. Clare have shown that maybe last year. Obviously, look as I said. 
they won by a point in the round robin. Then Nimrick got their avengers in the Munster final. But you can see that runners off the shoulder. But you have to probably break their half back line. If you can break that middle tour between the two sixty fives, we call it when I was playing the platform, the two sixty fives. You can break that line. Um, again, easier said than done when you have a serious amount of bodies. You could have eight nine fellas around there. But that's probably one area. But again, you have to get the ball in your hand as well. That is, it's great saying that you have these speedsters, but they're so confined, they're so congested in the tackle. They narrow the space. So if you get a ball in a half far, far line and you turn, it's rarely you see that you have 40, 50 yards of space in front of you. Maybe some other teams, they might leave it open, whereas they just, they just seem to have bodies around there all the time, which is, which is incredibly difficult to break down. Mm. Should we move on to the Watford Cork game, Michael? Yeah, I tell you what I just wanted to ask, Alan, with the, yeah. week, with, with the week that's in it. What's it like not being involved? What's it like being outside the bubble? Um, is it, I, it? It's probably hit you at different stages in the last few months, mm. but I'd imagine it hits hard enough kind of this week. Ah, uh, yeah. Look, you'll be lying. I think you'll be lying and saying saying everything is great. Oh, yeah, this week is great. You know, it's it's it's, it's challenging. You know, um, it's first time in 10, 11 years that I've been out of the system, shall we call it? Um, again, you wouldn't miss it as much maybe during the winter, but it's now when you look out the window and the weather's getting a little bit nicer you go on social media you see all the championship talk you know uh, who's well, what's the court team going to be named uh who's going to play against uh against limerick or whatever you know so it is look it is challenging but look at the same time i'm i'm content with my decision you know uh, they always say the first year is always the hardest when you step out of that bubble because you're so you're so engrossed in it um, but look, luckily enough, myself, I, I have been busy over the last number of months doing various things. But look, of course, look, the, the itch will be there when you're going out to Walsh Park. Probably the biggest itch would be on a Saturday night against Limerick. You know, that's that's a nice game to play or to be involved in. Like, um, you know, Saturday night, seven o'clock. If you can remember, twenty, what year was it when? Uh, I was. 2019, maybe down in Park the sun was the weather down there. Seven 18, o'clock. 18, 18, 18, Galant, Galant got it? sent off. Yeah. Yes, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, look, there's the itch will be there, obviously, you know. But look, that's, look, that's part of it. I, I did ten or ten or eleven good years, um, you know. So I'm looking from a different perspective now, and looking at from a uh, from a supporter, and just looking at different things. But look, obviously, this week's a little bit challenging. But look, such is life, and such is sport. Mm. And Alan, like because of like you had a lot of injuries, very unfortunate because you know mm. at times you were playing brilliant stuff. If you could go back to like when you were 17, 18, is there anything you'd do differently? I know you probably played a lot of duel at different mm. times. I wonder if you could go back, would you have maybe just played focused one only, or was that just not a factor even? Ah no, I don't think it was a factor. You have to remember too, like I teach fellas who are in school who are 17, 18, and you forget. They're only 17 and 18, you know. Um, at that time, you wouldn't. Like, I remember when I first started playing with Cork in 2014, I'd play a Munster Championship game against Kerry on a Wednesday night down in Surrey, and then I'd be on the bench or I'd start against, uh, I think it was one, one game, it was a Wexford a league game, for example, in Park. No problem. Quick turnaround, two games in a, in, a, in a week, like, or in a short space of time. So that probably wouldn't be a factor. Probably, again, just the type of player maybe that I am. Um uh, Physio describes it. One good year was that I've, I'm a fast, fast twitch player. So I have fast, fast twitch muscle fibers, basically. So I'm all about explosive, you know, compared to someone in the half hard line who, who maybe goes at 70, 80%, can go up and down like a footballer, let's say, whereas about going fast 20, 25 yard sprints. So, yeah, look, I had, I had my fair share of injuries, obviously, and maybe just a little bit unlucky as well, um, unfortunately. But look, as I said, look, I got 10 years out of it. I would have obviously liked to have continued on. I, look, I'm not going to lie, I'd still like to be involved, still like to be playing. But, you know, I reviewed last year when we finished up with Limerick, or when we, the last game against Limerick in the Gaelic grounds. And I just, I just had that sense. I spent that maybe a little bit extra on the field after last person to lead the draft. I just had a little bit of a sense that, and I'd review every year. At the end of every year, I'd have my diary and I'd just review it. Uh, and I just felt probably the right time was to step away uh, last year. Well, i tell you something, Alan. Me and Shane and a lot of people have never had to worry about too much about the fast twitch muscle fibers. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it's a, both a blessing and a curse, I suppose. Yeah, yeah it never, is. It is, you know. So Never go fast enough to get injured. Uh, another thing. Yeah. What, what was your, your favourite day in red? Oh, favourite day. Um, there's probably about three or four months making your debut, obviously. Is always ask any player, they'll always remember who you played, where it was, 
Coincidentally enough, it was against Waterford 2014. Uh, Munster final 2017 because we're coming off a very bad year, obviously the year previously. Um, ooh, coming on against Kilkenny in 2021, that game that went extra time, the year that we got to the All Ireland final. You know, uh, myself and Owen being on the pitch at the same time, we were both on the bench that that uh, that day. Uh, Owen got on. I think Jar Miller pulled his hamstring that day. Um, after 20 minutes, so he was on, so I got a chance to come on that day. So there are small little kind of games that you'd remember um, that would stand out in, in the memory. Mm. And what will the what will the players be feeling now in the hour going into throw-in this weekend against Waterford? Ah, look, listen, they're all vastly experienced. You know, they go through their process. They had their week structured. You know, I'd imagine it maybe would be Tuesday, Thursday, or it'd be Tuesday, Friday, maybe. Um, they're well used to it, as I said. There's a lot of lot of experienced lads there. Just again, two two good training sessions, maybe a gym session. Uh, stay out of the public, you know, because again, first round, first round game. Um, you know, you can see it there on social media already with Davy and playing the underdog. You know, up against it, all these kind of things. You know, uh, you try to you buy that. By the way, are you buying it? Do I buy it? Um, <sighs> It's look, you know, and I know Davy loves that, you know, the underdog, you know, relegated to Division One. Uh, if Waterford people want to uh, spread rumors, that's why all these, all these things are all kind of a bit of mind games, you know. Uh, it's part and parcel of championship hurling, especially in Munster when it's such a minefield. Um, but players, look, players have their routine. They try to stay away from all that kind of stuff as much as they can, obviously. Mm, Michael. Yeah, no, I, 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 like, where do you think Cork are going into? Going into Sunday, Alan. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a it's a it's a crucial game. He played him, when he played him last year. I think he won by nine. He won pulling mm. up. It's round one this time. Kind of sets the tone. Like mm. this will this will play. This will go a long way to to whether you're third, fourth, or fifth, or second mm. or first. If you get me, depending on how the results go. But where do you think Cork are at in the league? I'm kind of thinking started slow. Kind of had a fair idea where they wanted to be by the end of the league. Where do you mm. where do you see them at going into Sunday? Yeah, like you just hit the nail on the head there. Obviously, they started slow in the league, got a couple of wins under the belt, got a bit of momentum. Uh, obviously, would have liked to have progressed maybe a little bit further in the league just to get game time into a few players. I remember hearing that. It, it's it's a big game for we're not about Clare and Limerick, obviously being the, the standout game. This is a huge game, I think, for both teams. Um, both sets of managers, obviously, in their second season. Davey didn't shy away from the fact that a couple of months ago he said this is their All Ireland first game All Ireland they have you know they're going all out for it. Uh, it's down in Walsh Park. You know, like you know last year uh, we beat Cork beat them by nine points in Parky Cueve. You know uh, in the league this year Cork were nine points up against them. You say yeah happy enough. Water brought it back to two. Uh, so I, I don't think it's going to be as one-sided as people think, you know, as I mentioned there, Davey loves playing the, the underdog, wherever he goes, he loves having that underdog, you know, relegate to Division um, Division 1, or sorry, Division uh, Division 2, everyone's against us, that kind of card, you know, um, so I think it's going to be an interesting game, I don't think it's going to be as one-sided as people think, um, a very, very important game for both teams. But at saying, in saying that, I would hope and I think that Cork would have a little bit more strength and depth to come out of there uh, with a win and then set themselves up nicely uh, for a week later against Clare. This question has popped up twice, Alan. So I'm just going to ask here. Ask Alan um, who he would have as Cork number three. It has been a huge problem position for Cork. Who do you think starts three? I think Damien Callan starts three. Um, I... I think Dave, if you look at Damien, he has he's been consistent, I think, you know, um in the last maybe two, three years to be fair to him. And he, he's come under a lot of stick and uh, uh, a lot of bad press maybe over the last number of years. Like that's a question. My question is who who else could you put in there, you know? Um like what would have some big men, Michael Kiley, maybe, for example, inside their full forward. You need a strong person, you would rob Downey, obviously, maybe that could fill there, obviously, but I don't think he's a natural full back. Maybe he's more suited to a half back role. Um, you know, you mightn't have that cover to play in, in that position. Like you you look at the opposition that you're coming up, up against and you kinda you look in and say, right, who are the personnel that are going to be starting in the water to the far lane or the half forward or their half forward lane or whatever? And you, you work around that personnel. But I think look, as I said, Damon Callad, he's kinda nailed not nailed on that position, but he's kinda made that position his own in the last number of years. And look, people say there has 
there has been maybe problems in that area. Um, but maybe it's very out the field, maybe, that there are certain areas that need to be looked at as well. Pow Pow says Cork won't need a number three as Davy won't play any forwards. But uh, yes, that's true as well, you know. <laughs> yeah, I watched I the, the league game. Yeah, I saw the league game and like everyone was out like it was it was insane, like, you know, the way the way they set up. Hey, what were the problem what were the you said you mentioned that you didn't think three was necessarily a problem, that you thought there were problems further out the field. what what can you just talk me through those? Uh, I think though I think like you look at the car pub and they automatically think, oh, it's someone in the full back line that it's their problem, or you know, uh, the full forwards cleaning out our, our full back or make a change, for example. But it, it's it's probably a bigger picture that you have to look at, and that's where team analysis and people up in the stand that can see that it is the ball coming in too easy. Uh, are we not congesting the middle turn? No, I'm not talking about personnel, I'm just talking maybe about shape or structure. I think Pat Ryan alluded to that in the league that in the last. 15, 20 minutes of that game that Cork lost their shape and structure. Uh, that's a big thing. And it's a bit like Limerick, for example, congesting that middle third. So, like you have someone inside the full back there and you have a one on one situation or two on two with 40, 45 yards of space in front of you, it's very, very difficult to defend, you know. Um, it's not so much the per- personnel, it's maybe about just that, that shape and structure not allowing easy ball maybe to, to be hit into the opposition full forward. Like. If you see Watford line up with, let's say, and you know, you can change around some of these names if you want, but mm. Patrick Fitz and Desi Hutchinson in the full forward line, maybe Mikey Kiley in around there mm. as well. If you see Jack Prendergast, Patrick Curran, uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, Michael, Jamie Barron, Caleb Lyons, Tyg de Burka, Connor Prunty. Like if you see all these players playing, mm. and it, you know, and they play what we might see as more of a coherent game plan, mm. I mean, there's no reason that they can't give you. You know, you're full of it throughout this game. Oh, 100%. Down in Walsh Park, you know, I still think there'll be a good Waterford support there. Um, you know, and it's about finding that balance, maybe. You know, you mentioned some names there, like you have Patrick Curran inside there, you have Desi Hutchinson. Um, you know, these are fast, explosive players. You want quick ball into them, but then you can revert that then again and you can play that running game uh, from their half forward or from their midfielder. Jamie Barron coming through the middle, Jack Prendergast. So it's about finding that balance. Now, I know if I was playing the Waterford from far in last year, I'd be really frustrated because there was absolutely no ball coming in. Um, I, don't, I don't know what their tactic was, but it's about just maybe finding that happy medium maybe uh, with Waterford. But no doubt, second season involved, there's going to be something maybe thrown in differently that they, did, that they didn't do last year maybe. Because as I said, both managers maybe are under a little bit of pressure. You know, first, first game, Important to get a win, get two points on the board because there's no easy games, you know, in Munster. Mm. Is Ben Cunningham, do you know if he's fit enough and could they throw him straight in? He was so good with the under 20s. So good in the under 20s. Um, probably disappointed, you know, I don't know if he had injuries or not, that he didn't get any maybe a bit of league time. Um, it's hard. There's a big jump, you know, there's a big jump from coming from that under 20 to go straight into a championship game. You know, I think you could have done that maybe a couple of years ago, fine, whereas no. To get thrown into championship party maybe with no game time or with no league game time just to kind of give him a little bit of confidence for example i think it's a bit of a risk um no as i said i don't know when, when you step out of that bubble you kind of don't you kind of you step away from it you know you don't know as much information but i would be guessing that they wouldn't try and throw him in this weekend maybe and uh, that they might hold him back maybe maybe 10 15 minutes maybe the following week or whatnot is there uh-huh. any worry on it so, some people would say you know, Cork can't expect to progress from Munster with three lads over thirty in their forward line, i.e. Harnady, Lahan, Hoggy. Like, what do you make of that? I, I, I get, but I, I, I imagine by your laugh, I don't think you agree with that. Who would you say were the two best forwards last year for Cork? Yeah, no, I would say I'd say Harnady and I'd say Harnady and, and Hoggy were yeah, two best. Yeah. To be fair to them. so yeah, look, you can obviously throw that in and say. Patrick is 35, I think. Yeah. Seamus is 33, going on 34. Of course, look, the way the game has gone, 70 minutes of hurling. But they were probably Cork's two best forwards last year. I think there's no denying that. So, you know, it's great to put in fellas. But in saying that, you know, you still need, if your fellas delivering at whatever age they're at, I still think if they're showing their worth, which they have now in the league, might be a little bit different. But I still, I don't think you can maybe push them to one side just because they're they're 33, 34, 35. And Alan Connolly scored two goals when the teams mm. met a couple of years ago. 
obviously six goals in his last two games as well. Is like, what are you expecting from him? Because it feels like this player, like he's been on the cusp of, I don't know, just being an excellent player, but so many injuries have gotten in his way. But how good is he? Yeah, I had him below Rochester Stone. So, um, like, he was, uh, what is he, in, he was in sixth year there. He was 19. So, you could see automatically, you know, uh, he obviously plays with Black Rock, well-established player there. So, he had his injuries over the last number of years. But I suppose you see him when, it, when we met two years ago here, he got two goals uh, down in Walsh Park. You saw when he made his comeback this year. Now, you could say it was against Offaly, for example, where he got three goals. I think 3-3 three, three it was. So, obviously, look, this is a massive addition into the Cork squad, just for, for depth, squad depth as well. Um, I'd imagine that he would start based off his form in top of the square, obviously. But he, he is a bit of a goal poacher, obviously. Um, no, whether Connor, Prun- Connor Prunty plays full-back, we don't know. Um, no, he's a different kettle of fish, really good, tight defender, very physical. Um, but, as I said, look, obviously last year, um, Alan wasn't involved. So this year, it would be a huge plus uh, having him on. I think he's uh, he's definitely has the, showing the right attributes over the last number of weeks in the leagues. Mm, OK. Michael, uh, who, who do you think is going to win this game? Uh, I think, I, think I, I do think, um, I do think Waterford will come with, I don't think it'll be as negative maybe as we saw throughout the league. I think they'll open up potentially at different stages and I think there will be a bit of fire and they do have nearly all their best players back available. De Bork is back, will make will make his first competitive appearance in a year. Prunty is back. Barron is fit, has games under his belt. Desi is back. Mikey Kite. Like, when you go through the personnel, lads, it's... Like That's a lot of personnel there, no matter yeah. that you mentioned. Like, and yeah, like, what, real good players, like. And Waterford, have, there's not really much talk coming out of there, you know, which would be my little bit... Con- not concerned, but they're going in nice under the radar, you know, didn't come out of Munster last year, relegated, as I said. So, you know, there's a lot of negativity around Waterford, but they're going about their business nice and quietly since the league. So, I mean, as we all know here, championship is totally different to league. Mm. Now, they have to they have to produce something on Sunday, Shana, because Davey mm. basically said after the league, they were relegated to 1B. He said, don't judge us on league, judge us on Munster. Like, Munster last year started well, should have got a result against Emmerich, finished well against Tipperary, albeit they were out. What happened in between was was very, very poor. Like, like if they're beaten six or seven on Sunday, they're on the back foot big time. And I'd say Davies on the back foot as well. I expect it to be very tight. Um, I do think Cork will win by probably two or three, but I would expect it to be very tight. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Waterford started particularly um, sharp and were leading most of the way. And maybe the last ten or fifteen, Cork will will catch them and win by two or three. But I, mm. I I am expecting a performance from Watford, providing they play a lot more positively than we have seen. And I do think I do think they will play a bit more positively at least, and it'll be more ball going into the full forward line than there has been because they've too many killers inside not to be feeding them. Mm. Yeah, and shouldn't they show last year by playing quite well against Limerick that they're able to compete against? Oh, yeah. teams. They beat Tipperary, irrespective of whether Tip had an off day or not, they beat Tipperary mm-hmm. fair and square. When, when you beat them two years ago down in Walsh Park, Alan, like Seamus Harnady was unbelievable that day. I think he scored five points. He was catching puck out, knocking him over the bar. Alan Connolly with the two goals as well. And I just thought at the time, like Waterford had won the league in brilliant fashion. And yeah, beat, they beat us. Yeah. Beat you up a stick in the league final. And, and <laughs> no, but they're Cheers, thanks, Shane. Cheers, Shane. thanks. No, but thanks like, for that. No, but and then I was going to say, and you were so good then at the end of it. But I'm just wondering, like, can is is it one of these things that where Watford can't deal with expectation, and sometimes you're expected to beat them, and they kind of shock you. Yeah. Is that is is it true that form goes out the window with these local rivalries? Do you feel? So, like, going back to your point there, the local rivalry, like this goes back to the noughties. I remember going to Cork Waterford games in 2004, 5, 6, 7, even like what games that you went to up in Turles Crow Park, like you know, mm. one there against in 2006, Kemmergra last minute free, just about over the bar. So, there's massive rivalry there. Does form like you look at the league final that they beat us that year, and as you said, they hammered us out the gate. Um, like Liam Cattle was in charge that time. Did they peak too soon, maybe? Mm. Who knows? Do you know? That's another factor. Two years ago, we, again, Cork always play our best when our backs are to the wall. I think, correct me if I'm wrong now, did Clare beat us that year up in Turles in the first game? 
in the round robin. I can't remember. All I remember is going to Walsh Park that year and saying, we have to win this. If we don't win this, our Munster Championship is over. We're done. Um, and we came out with a win that day. And Seamus Harney, as, as you can remember, you just alluded to there, you know, hurled up a storm that day. Just on, on Cork and Waterford lines, when you think about it, like, you go back through go back through the noughties, like, you go through the games, there's M- Milan flipping off the, the Cork supporters. Um, on We're going to tour the house there, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the back. The battery's going to go off. <laughs> <laughs> go back, go back. The fast twitch muscle fibers are still working, which, which is good uh, to see. Up, up the stairs there, the hamstring might be a little bit tight going up there, but they'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, but just like the history of these two counties is phenomenal. You have Paul Flynn's dipper in 04, you have Milan getting sent off, you have Milan getting the hat trick, you have Don Logue saving the ball from, from Ken McGrath, you have Ken McGrath's catch at the end of the 04 Munster final, I think it was. You have Big Dan's goal in the replay in 2010 Munster final under lights. Like you'd be hoping for another instalment of that, um, and you'd be hoping for a cracker of a game as well. I, I just, I, I, I just hope Waterford played their part in that. But fair idea, fair idea. Anyway, what we're going to, what we're going to get from Cork, it's just a matter of whether Waterford take the shackles off and cut loose this morning. I think they will. I think they will take off the shackles. I think they can. I don't think they can go out last year and do exactly what they did, having Desi Hutchinson out in the forty-five or sixty-five getting ball. You know. He wears he's most dangerous close to goal. You know, you want your best forwards receiving the ball closer to the goal because the further out you get, the player that's marking him, happy days. He's no danger, no trip. Where if you have the likes of Desi Hutchinson, for example, or in our case, Patrick Organ, closer to the goal, you get a ball there and you're 25 yards out and he he's a ball in his hand, there's trouble straight away. Well, just before we mo- try and pick who will come out of the Munster and Leinster Championships, Alan, who, who's your favourite forward inside forward to watch at the moment and what is it that excites you about an inside forward oh inside forward um i the game is game has changed i think a bit like you obviously have not like you take limerick for example you have who probably gets all the credit would be galan obviously inside with seamus flanagan for example with peter casey coming out you know you see the role that peter casey does was it in the All Ireland twenty twenty one? He got five points playing that we called the fifteen roll out in the forty five, getting tackles, hooks, blocks, getting on ball. But he still scored five or six points that day. Um. So like, obviously, look, you you have your your Glan inside. Obviously, you'd you'd watch their movement. For example, I remember when I was playing, I'd always I'd always watch other forwards' movements. You know, even even now going to the games and going to the Cork games, I wouldn't be looking at the ball. I'd be looking at the inside forward line on both teams and just seeing what their movement is like, what space are they trying to create. So the ball could be up one side of the field and I'd just be watching. Uh, I remember going to the Kilkenny game this year down at Park Creep, just looking at the two sets of forwards, inside forward line, seeing how they move, like Owen Cody, for example, you know, a couple of scores that he gets. He, he'd be a player that I watch a lot, but he'd be totally different maybe to the likes of Aaron Galan, maybe, you know. Um, so they'd, be two, they'd obviously be the two probably... Um, forwards that I'd keep a close eye on maybe and just, just watching different things maybe that you can learn from um, over the years. Hey, no point in asking you different players that happen during games. You're looking at a different game than most other people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't mind looking at me. Ask you anything. Let's, let's get to the awkward part now. Michael, uh, we'll start off with you. Who's going to be your number one in both Leinster and Munster? Um, I think Claire will be one in Munster. Limerick will be two, and Cork will be three. So Clare, Limerick, and Cork. Cork. Right, okay, you've written off Tipperary. You're looking to make enemies straight away. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do, I do think, I, I do think he will. You, you are not nearly as bad as he were in the league semi final. Um, I just think even with Seamus Kendi been out now, I have doubts about you at six. I do think I do think you'll you'll um you'll definitely pick up points like maybe three or four, but I don't think it'll I don't think it'll be enough. Okay, so I'll say tip number one. No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll say tip clear or sorry, Limerick clear and Tipperary. You what know you Limerick have, you know Limerick have never finished top of the round robin tables. Yeah. Haven't they? No, no actually, they've, ne- no, they've, they've never finished top. Clare have finished top twice, you finished top in eighteen. 
and Tip finished top in 19. And the only team in Munster to finish top and win the Munster Championship after was, was yourselves in 2018. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, actually, as well as that, Galway in 18 are the only um, Leinster County to finish top and win the win the province as well. Kilkenny finished top in 19, beaten in Leinster final, um, and Galway finished top 22-23, beaten in Leinster final as well. So, it's a funny one. Who's your 1-3, Alan? You want them in order. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> I'm going to go Limerick 1, Clare 2, Cork 3. Okay. And would have been some crack if you didn't pick Cork within the top three. <laughs> Jesus, that would have been priceless. You just, you just see the messages coming in. <laughs> you run out of Douglas very quickly if you did that. Yes. <laughs> what do you think, Michael, then with Leinster? Um, well, like I, history would, would suggest that like Galway have only been beaten once in Leinster in the round robin. That was by Dublin in 2019, which end up knocking them out. So. Like Galway have proven themselves um, throughout that round robin campaign, so it'll be Galway one, Kilkenny two, Wexford three. Right, Wexford three. So you're you're writing off Dublin. Well, do you know uh, what? Yeah, I, th I think I think Wexford are in a better spot going into the to going into this weekend's game um, than Dublin are, and this weekend's game will go a long way to deciding who takes who takes at least the third spot potentially potentially higher than that as well. Yeah, I think Dublin will shock them, and I think it'll be Galway and Kilkenny uh, going through. What do you think, Alan? Yeah, I'd be the same as uh, Michael there. I think just Galway this year. I think I think they have a massive kind of boost having Eamon O'Shea involved um, from a forwards perspective. Obviously, they looked fairly impressive in the league. Um, obviously, they gave up in Salt Hill against Limerick. Um, you know uh, that game was a uh, draw. Uh, I go Kilkenny two, and I would go Wexford three. Um, but I would I would say Galway, Kilkenny, Leinster final, and I would probably say just a puck of a ball between those two in the Leinster final. Okay. And have you been impressed by Kilkenny this year in general, like in terms of all Ireland contender? Yeah, yeah. You have de you have to say you have been. I think like Derek Ling has come in, and you know Kilkenny were known for their just get the ball, lump it, get rid of it. Um, you know, when I saw them playing against Cork, they, they used, they kind of found that balancing act, you know, between playing the ball short, playing it through the lines, but also not afraid then to deliver it in long. Now, I did see a small little bit of a change when they played uh, Clare in the league final. Um, I remember seeing Richie Reid getting ball and they were just lumping it. Like, I was I was kind of a bit, a bit amazed by that. So I remember watching it at home and going, every ball that they got, they just seemed to pocket long and with TJ injured um, that night I just thought it was a bit of a strange tactic that you know why would he start pucking ball down long and again you look at their Clare half back line quite dominant with John Conlon for example Jeremy Ryan um, but definitely I, for all Ireland contenders uh, certainly they would be up there um, you know and I think look as I said I don't think they'd be too worried about what happened in the league final against Clare if they were there obviously they would have liked to have won it but I think it was probably more of an important game for Clare in terms of their development, but certainly I think um, Kilkenny Galway Leinster final with a puck of a ball, but I think still think Galway might finish top that day. Mm. Michael, no, yeah, I, I, I like. There's been there's been very little between Galway and Kilkenny last year, but just on Galway, like winning a Leinster title this year is absolutely non-negotiable. Like they have to win Leinster this year. Like, there's a bit of pressure there, I think, Michael. You'd oh agree? God, there is. Yeah, like. Like Henry is signed for I think until the end of twenty twenty five. But barring they win an All Ireland through the back door, or maybe get to an All Ireland final through the back door, they like the, Leinster is the only show in town for them. Gets them straight through to an All Ireland semi final. If if they don't if they don't win it this year, like I wouldn't be surprised if it ended at if his reign ended at the end of this year because we haven't seen anything tangible yet, and that's not having a go at like that. This is like one of the best players that ever played the game. It's his first inter county gig, but there's no. I can't see any real differences in Galway so far under his reign than that compared to before. And see, Kenny always raised their game when they play Galway just because of the Sheffield factor, you know, uh, that they don't want to be beaten by, by Henry, obviously. And we've seen that, like, they were dead and buried there last year in the Leinster final. Kenny Buckley, whether you say it was a fluke or not, you know, they still came out dumb. You saw what it meant to them, you know, if that was maybe a Dublin or a Wex, would it have meant that much?
Mm. I think Alan, you're covering the mic maybe okay. with your thumb, but oh yeah, sorry. A, a final question before we let you go, and this is a this is a nice one now. It we're looking at maybe twenty years now since Cork won in All Ireland. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <laughs> and look, it's 10 for Kilkenny anyway. Well, it's heading for 10, hopefully. Um, is there pressure within Cork for that to end this year? Are people a bit more pragmatic and thinking it might take another couple of years for all the brilliant talent to come through and make good on it? Uh, yeah, look, there's there's bo both sides of it, I think. Um, like it's going nearly 20 years since we've won North Ireland. Every year that you go out and you represent Cork, you know, there's pressure. You know, the Cork public. Uh, they expect an All Ireland. They expect to win. Um, I don't think it, it's as easy as people say. Just because we've won under twenty titles in the last two years or three years, and we have these influx of young players, and Limerick have done that, um, doesn't mean it's just going to happen overnight for us. You know, you've seen the journey that Limerick have gone on to, um, starting probably with their academy and their underage, for example. But there is, yeah, look, the, the Cork public not beat around the bush. They expect Cork to be all Ireland contenders, to be there towards the latter ends of kind of whenever start of July, whenever the all Ireland is middle of July. Um, but it's incredibly difficult. You know, you look at Munster there. Like I predicted there, Limerick, Clare, Cork. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if Tip do something or if Waterford do something. There's going to be something shown in there like last year. Waterford beating Tip up in Turles, who would have predicted that? You know, no one would have. So I definitely no, didn't. <laughs> no, you didn't. You know, and there's no. there, let's be honest, let's be honest with you. There's a bit of pressure this year. Cork didn't come out of Munster last year, so you know we we Cork public will expect 100 that we get out of Munster this year and be there thereabouts come the latter end of the season. Mm, okay, well look, Alan, really appreciate it. Great analysis, bit of crack as well. So bit of crack, lads. Good to have you on. Thanks a million. Cheers, Alan. Thank you. Good man. Oh, great, great to have Alan there. Um, just we must get him again in the future. Yeah, Shane, but... oh, like uh, in his pomp, gets ball in hand. Like once he had ball in hand, that was it. You were done. He was so fleet forward. That left hand side was so sweet as well. Like he was, he was not yet unstoppable at different times. I remember him coming on. He come on in two thousand nineteen quarter final against Kilkenny. I just remember him being brilliant the same day with Hoggy. Um, I uh, very very hard to stop in his day. Yeah, very, very good in 2014 as well when they got all the way to an All-Ireland semi-final. Um, so this weekend, we know that Antrim are going to go to Kilkenny. And fair enough, Darren Gleeson has been able to bring back some of those names that are missing. Uh, you know, uh, like That's very, very important for them, obviously. But it's very hard to make a case for anything except a comfortable Kilkenny win there. And you would say the same, that Galway against teams that aren't quite at the top tier against Carlo. You're just nearly hoping that this doesn't get ugly. Uh, the Antrim game, it's funny you should say that. I have a piece in the, in the paper tomorrow about Owen Campbell. I was chatting him at the, the Leinster launch and he was, uh, he was, you know, he was quite real about the league. He said that they, at different times during, you know, training with injuries and stuff like that, that they didn't have enough to hardly play an 8v8 game. They were down that many different lads and they were. he said they were nearly struggling to, to get a team together at different stages with the amount of injuries they've had. And he just said it's been chalk and cheese in the last three or four weeks. They got um, Nigel Elliott back in, Sean Elliott, Keelan Malloy, Ryan Elliott. Um, the, the four of them back. Now they've, he said they're 35 or 36 training. They're able to play in-house games. He said they're in a completely different place going into the round robin as compared to during the league. Now they're going to have to be. He also said like that, that they have realistic aspirations to get into an entry final or get into the top three. Um which is fanciful, I would say now, to say the least, that getting points on the board and particularly winning that Carlo game, I'd say is a bit more realistic. But the vibe is definitely, and the mood music is definitely um, a lot better around Antrim than it would have been throughout the league. And we were obviously highlighting all the players that they were missing and the results didn't go didn't go for them. I think they were minus 74 across their five games and that throws in like a, a one-score defeat to, to Dublin as well. So they're beaten by an average of nearly 20 points in, in the remainder of the four games. So they have a hell of a lot to turn around. Um, and their record... You know, while playing against Kilkenny in a couple of league games, particularly up in Corrigan, wouldn't be that bad. It's generally been a di been a different story uh, in championships. Obviously, in Nolan Park as well. Anything other than a than a big Kilkenny win would be a, would be a big surprise. Yeah, it was five thirty one to three twenty last year. Massey Keown got three three for himself. TJ scored two ten. 
And you have to only go back 81 years for Antrim's only championship win over Kilkenny, 1943. Amazing. World War II was still going on. So um, that wasn't today or yesterday, Michael. <laughs> well, certainly not. <laughs> to be fair, the, the one big game in Leinster this weekend, and look, they are big games for every player involved, the other ones, but Wexford against Dublin. If Dublin, Dublin have everybody available, they've got a pretty good team here. A spine the whole way through. Uh, we'll just start from goalkeeper. Sean Brennan, Owen O'Donnell, assuming that he's uh, reverts back to full back. Chris Crummy has been playing centre back. Um, just go up to centre forward, then uh, you're probably looking at Donald Burke. Maybe he'll be on the wing. They've other good players around that as well. And then Paul Crummy is a good target man on the inside. Bring back Paddy Doyle. We haven't seen much of him since last year. Obviously, he had a bit of um, injury woes. Like, you still have Danny Sutcliffe there. You still have Connor Burke there. Um, Mark Grogan, hopefully, he's back. He's another good option. Don't know who Paddy Smith, yeah. When you get everybody available, that's a pretty damn good team that will push Wexford all the way. And Wexford haven't beaten them since 2018 in the Championship. Yeah. Um, Dublin have beaten them the last two times, obviously, in round robin, and they drew, and they drew in 19. Um, I, the only thing, and I, I, we said it about Waterford, about, you know, they have have a lot of their best players back, and they do. But I, I would still take, I'd still take being in Wexford position where they've thrown in some new faces throughout the league. A lot of their usual faces have gotten plenty of league action as well and you're not just hoping and praying that the last six weeks that the lads are up to speed for this first game which is you know probably the most one of the most important games that they're going to play um it, it's great it's it's like with uh with, with kelly with tony kelly you're not sure exactly where he is they're not 100 percent sure where o'donnell is uh and a couple half of the limerick more, team yeah uh, so, uh i would not half but like there's there's several, and there's a few that have just come back, haven't looked right, and you're thinking, a month later, are they going to be 100% right? So there's question marks with a lot of teams. Yeah, there is, um, and that's probably a lot to do with the with the condensed season and just the fact that there's less time maybe between games. Um, I know Jared Burns was kind of half floating the idea of the All-Irelands potentially going back to September. I, I, I would, uh, just on a, a brief aside there, I do think we can we can buy a couple of more weeks and potentially go into August, but I wouldn't be I wouldn't be going back to September, no way. Um, I, I think I think the season suits both inter-county and, and club at the minute. But just back on, on Wexford and Dublin, I, I like I, I have to say I, I liked what I saw from Wexford throughout the league and they were missing plenty of lads and Liam Ogg was only got back for the last game, same with Conor Mack, mm. same with Matt O'Hanlon. But and and obviously Chin missed the last game and is just coming back from a hamstring injury as well. But the new faces I thought really stepped up, the likes of Conor Foley, Keane Byrne, Conor Hearn's not necessarily a new face, but he's you know relatively new in the scene. Richie Lawler as well. I just think, and I like the I like the way they I like the way they play as well. It's a lot more proactive maybe than it had been in recent seasons, and I, I would I would give them the edge, particularly on home side. Okay, um, I suppose I also saw that uh, I was reading in the Nina Guardian that the Munster GA referees administrator Johnny Ryan has said that there'll be a targeted clampdown on throwing and over carrying as the intercounty uh, senior hurling championship gets underway this weekend. Uh, he said the message will be given to referees that the hand uh, is the hand pass and the overcarrying. If you let those technical fouls slip, then aggressive fouls might follow as frustration sets in. There never has a truer word been spoken because the amount of times you see it, and like we've mentioned how good David Fitzgerald is, he takes seven to eight steps every time that he's setting off. And a lot of players seem to get away with it. They're like, everybody knows you'll get away with six, but it's now been pushed to the seven and the eight. He's not the only player doing it. There's loads of them doing it. But the the only issue I have there is like that if that is the the letter of law that they're going to call, then they're just going to be blown every every ten or fifteen seconds. But like why like why didn't they implement it properly for the duration of the league and at least at least get lads in the habit of this is how it's going to be unless there's a clear strike and action with your hand or whatever and on the steps as well. Like those games could potentially be ruined completely ruined at the weekend if they decide to referee games a completely different way than has games have been refereed so far this year. Generally, it's been very hard line in the league on certain tackles, certain rules, and it eases off a bit come summer. If they take a really hard line for this weekend's games and beyond, it's going to be a pure whistle fest. 
Yeah, Leash against Offaly really is the big game in the Joe McDonough Cup this weekend. What's the mood around in the WhatsApp groups that Michael Verney's attached to? <laughs> not attached to too many WhatsApp groups that will be going into minute detail about Offaly hurling, but from what I heard, they played a game against Carlo uh, in the last couple of weeks anyway, uh, and took a bit of a beating. Again, it's hard to know exactly um, what personnel they had available to them with the 20s going on and that as well, but probably still not great for the mood around the place. You would be expecting that to be a very, very competitive game. And I know technically Carlo are playing a grade above them in the in the Leinster Championship. There should be very, very little between those those two sides based on the McDonough last year. This is a massive game. Offaly won the corresponding fixture last year and it put them in a really, really good spot where they could actually ease off towards the end of the McDonough as they did um, and earn the right to do. And Leash were on the back foot straight away after the first game last year, after the lost Offaly. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge game, derby game. I would always see uh, Leash and Offaly in hurling as way more of a derby than it would be in football. Maybe that's just given my proximity. I wouldn't be a million miles away from Leash. It'd be very close to, well, close enough to places like Clannis Lee, Rose and Alice, etc. Um, but uh, I probably, like Leash are coming in, with fairly good form under behind them now, and I know it's Division Two A form, but they fairly paced at Carlo in that Division Two A final when the game looked like it was going to be tight. So, I, I, you know, like looking at the form, I'd probably be leaning in the direction of Leash. Of course, I want I want Offaly to win, but this has a huge ramifications for. I think Offaly are playing West Mead in the second game, so there's your two big games straight up. You Offaly, Offaly lose one of those games and maybe a draw um they're out if they lose both they're out you know what i mean so there's so much riding on this game at the weekend and if you have a number of those younger players lining out and maybe you have a better insight on that and it becomes a physical game which i think leash would want in there in a more parked or home ground and it can be intimidating the crowd is in on top of you in a way like that would not be the type of game that your younger players would excel at because they are brilliant when there's a bit of space and the game's a bit faster. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like, like Dan Raven has a, a robust and physical enough player, but he, you know, it's just the nature of it. He's not, you know, been exposed to senior inter county. He's only a young fella. He's going to want a different type of game. Adam Screen, he's going to want a different type of game. Cotton King, if he's playing, would be a robust type of player too. But. Again, that's 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 been robust at under twenty level. This is a, a massive step up physically. We'd be, you know, trying to use the ball a lot better to be more advantageous to these boys rather than getting involved in a big kind of a bruise and war, particularly around that middle as well. I'd say probably three to four of the twenties, I'd say, will start, including those three lads that I, that I mentioned there. Um, and it's going to be a very very busy period for those lads as well. Yeah, I think most people would expect Westmead to go to Kerry and pick up a result. I mean, that, Shane Conway's yeah. out for the McDonough as well. Did you see that, Shane? Like that was yeah. like massive, massive loss. They're on the back foot straight away before a ball is poked. Yeah, and then in the other game that we were mentioning earlier, Mead against Down. Down have had some good performances at times as well, and I think they'd probably be expected to win that game. Ah, Jesus! Well, like Mead only changed management management less than five weeks ago, so I know Stephen Clinch, one of their best servants, is coming in as manager now. But like, maybe they'll get a bit of a bounce off him coming in. Um, Sirius Bolton, Bolton obviously left after they won the Christie Ring and uh, the Two B last year. Didn't have a good league campaign. Um, yeah, Mead are going. Mead are going. You'd imagine Mead are going to struggle. Down have been. You'd have to say one of probably one of like Ron Ron and Sheaton has really got them to a pitch the last four or five years, and they've generally performed really, really consistently. And uh, yeah, you'd be making them strong favourites for that game at the weekend. Okay, so down they're going to be at home in that game against Meath. It's Leash at home against Offaly. West Mead, they're going to be hosting Kerry at Mullingard. Christy Ring Derry, they're at home to Tyrone. London will meet Sligo and Ryslip. And in Hawkfield, Kildare will do battle with Wicklow. Then the Nicky Rackard, Monaghan will meet uh, Ross Common and Inishkeen, Donegal Mayo and Letterkenny, and at Dowdleshall, Loud will face Armagh. Laurie Maher, Warwickshire against Leitrim in Birmingham, Fermanagh, Longford and Enniskillen, and in Glenavy, Lancashire will play against Cavan. Um, in the football this weekend, Derry against Donegal, that's going to be a bit of a cracker, or it certainly should be. 
uh, maybe for the side shows as much as anything, Cavan can they get enough scores against the Tyrone team that really will suck you in and uh, strip the ball off you if you're in any way naive. Waterford will meet Clare. That's a huge one there because the, the winner is going to be in the Sam Maguire competition and certainly Clare would be favourite there. Kerry against Cork. Um, at Fitzgerald Stadium and I think we're even done with the era now of Cork being built up by ex Kerry players and so on. Oh Michael you're, you're after re reappeared but on a different um device by the looks of it. No, I nearly did a nearly did an Adam Cadigan there. I was just about to go on the I was just about to go on the phone. Yeah just um do you see any reason to talk up Cork against Kerry this weekend in the football Munster semi final? Not really, but they've been one of the, they were one of the highest scoring teams from play. I think in the last three or four rounds of the league, the, you wouldn't say they blew away Limerick in that Munster quarter final either. Um, like, geez, it's been I know like take that COVID game um out of the equation in twenty twenty when they shocked Kerry after extra time with that marquee goal and the like, when was the last great. Cork and Kerry game like well the year after they they were level with them after about 40 45 minutes and they were pretty good but they just didn't have the bench and Kerry did that was uh that was the Parky Rin game was it Jack yeah, yeah. Is that 21 or 22 yeah I, I just remember uh, it's funny I just remember Roy Keeman on the terrace in Parky Rin that's all I wanted to, and the camera panning to him yeah they were competitive for about 45 minutes or that or whatever yeah but that was 22 just, yeah 23 yeah. points to 11 though they really pulled away just looks like there's there's kind of levels here, and you'd you'd, ima you'd imagine Carrier. It's very hard to get excited about it, and it's mad. Like when you look at the hurling championship, and obviously particularly the Munster hurling championship, and everything is just so boom, 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 and you have to be at the pitch straight away. And you look at the first couple of rounds of the Division One football league, and you're thinking, yeah, teams are trying to get to a level here. You know, it's almost like they're easing off. The provincials, very, very, it's impossible really to get excited about three of the provincials anyway, and particularly when you look at Leinster last weekend. And like Kerry are going to, you'd imagine Kerry would ease, would ease through, you'd have to say. Yeah, and then Mayo against Roscommon in the Connacht Championship, and also Sligo against Galway. To be fair, Mayo against Roscommon should be a quite good game. Uh, last year it was Roscommon 2 8, Mayo 10. So Mayo will be out for a little bit of a revenge here. And look, what we saw so far was a match in New York that wasn't really a match. It was more of a, I suppose, a jolly up for a few people. <laughs> no more than anything else. But uh, yeah, look, this is the first real test for Mayo since the league. Yeah, um, Roscommon obviously came into the championship last year on the back of it being really consistent in Division 1. They came into the championship this year on the back of being relegated from Division 1. And yeah, like we've obviously have had Davy Burke on the show, and he he did his own show even a couple of years ago with with Enda Varley. The mood music has changed ever so slightly in Roscommon, and they kind of need a performance at the weekend. Um, like they were they were well beaten. Was it was it two nineteen to one nine in the last game against Derry in the league, despite being you know good to a point in that game. Um, Davy Burke has had a bit of time like he'd bemoaned the fact that he hasn't had all his players together he's had plenty of time to get them all together in the last while so there'll be no excuses going into the weekend and I think a win might be just beyond them but a very very competitive show on and bringing it right down to the wire um, is important for them OK, well, look, that's it for the show this week. We'll be back again next week with plenty more of the same review and what's, uh, what's going to happen in what should be a pretty cracking weekend. A reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code RGAME and you get 15% off. Michael, enjoy the weekend. See you, Shadow.